All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 14th, 2023. And today we are going to have some exciting connections. We are going to show kind of a, a build on the last video. I know there, there was so much and it still had questions for, for some people to, to see the clarity because there was a lot connected there. Uh, those that have been around for a while, you know, they they did understand it. They did get it. But today, with more information to add to the picture, I am going to prove what I believe is the absolute revelation of the time of the escape of the Bride of Christ based on the five and a half years and the revelation that the 50 wasn't before, but that the 50 was after the Feast of Weeks. I think it was pretty straightforward in the last video to have understood that it all begins at true Feast of Weeks. Well, today, I'm going to bring even more evidence to prove it out. And if this is the 70th year, as we have also proven and shared and we discussed in the last video and, and in a number of recent videos, then this is it. This is it. The understanding, though, is which is the true Feast of Weeks? And you're going to see, even after today's video, we might not be completely sure if it's if it's the week before or the week that we're going to be focusing on the this day, or it's going to be the week before. And we're going to cover why, and we're going to get into all that as well. And you'll remember from the last video um, that that we looked at some options that you know there were three of them in relation to the Feast of Weeks of which I believe the one from the, the, the Sabbath counts to the 8th of Sivan was one that was possible, but it was more the fringe one, and that we were looking to the 7th Sabbath being the 15th of Sivan, and then the 50 days starting on the 16th. And the other option that was really a good probability was the one that adding 10 more days because the moon comes out early by 10 days. Well, you're going to see that I'm going to reverse it a bit here today, and you're going to see why. I'm not saying that I don't believe the count that we were sharing from, from, so we were looking at either this being the seventh Sabbath and this being the beginning of the 50 days, or this being the seventh Sabbath, right? The, the time of the Feast of Weeks and then the 50 days beginning. But the other option was if the moon was 10 days off, which we read about in Jubilees, then it wouldn't even be the 15th of Sivan. It would be the 25th of Sivan. And we had Psalms eight, uh, 19, after Psalms 18, you guys know the story of it. That brings us to the circuit of the sun. So I'm not dismissing this and saying, oh, it's no longer a probability, but you're gonna understand why today the focus is right here. You're going to see it today and you're going to understand why it's the focus. And the connection is whether this is where the, the beginning of the count begins, which means the, the first Sabbath is right here. Okay, second, third, right? You know, we know how to count it. I can even prove that the Sabbaths are the 15th, 22nd, 29th, 8th, and so forth. You're going to see, I think uh, we'll get into that quite a bit later on, but I'm going to prove it using scripture. It literally says it. And here we were, we had followed it for quite a bit, got a little bit sidetracked and distracted, kind of like we did with the Feast of Weeks, right? We got a, a little sidetracked and distracted with the Feast of Weeks being Pentecost when we knew it's seven Sabbaths, then numbering 50 days. But we're going to get into all that. And before we get into all that, we're, I mean, we're going to cover some things. We're going all the way back to the beginning. I'm going to share a little something about the beginning and the guy, John, that I met. I'm going to show some scriptures about what I think might be connected to that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the revelation Jodell confirmed for me. And we're going to show what it revealed and what it meant. That, that literally proves that we cannot be a month off that where the calendar in the Hebrew calendar is, is correct. The months are in the place they should be. 
because you're going to realize that if you believe, if you have a belief, and I know there's a number here in our ministry of people that are believing it's possible, that if you believe that, then all of the revelations that we have had about Taurus, you don't believe them. You're throwing them out the window. And you're going to see, we're going to cover these revelations from Taurus. That's why I'm going to share that piece in Jodel again. And you're going to see the absolute journey that that was and, and see the importance of it and how it connects to what we're going to delve into about, you know, maybe about halfway through or so and how it delves in to showing and revealing more of this timing all the way from in the beginning to the birth of Christ, to his death and resurrection, to why it equals the Feast of Weeks in that time frame of this year. All right. So without any further ado, as I always do, um, come to the playlist. For anybody that's new to this ministry, come to this link right here, Playlist, because you're going to hear things that to you for the first time, you're going to start scratching your head. You're going to hear me talking about 21 years, that, that the big picture of the end of days is 21 years. It's also a big picture since in the beginning of creation is really a 21,000 year picture. And the new beginning, the, the, the end of it all is the 22nd thousandth year. All right. You're going to see that the whole picture is 21 years. It's 777 and then the final Jubilee. 777, right? It's, it's the menorah. Okay, you've got seven almond blossoms, seven almond blossoms, seven almond blossoms, and one. 7771. That is the revelation of the end. But the first seven years are what we call quote unquote easy years. You're not in the tribulation, but the bride is being woken up. The spirit is working and is alive in well in waking up the bride and revelation is being given and all sorts of things are happening. And then, of course, we can see the events going on around the world, building and building and building for anybody who's watching and praying attention, seeking and searching the word as well. All right. So you're going to hear the out of that 21, the focus. We're going to chat a little bit about the 21 in the beginning, but the main portion is the 14 years. OK, you're going to come to hear 14 years. You're going to hear that it's seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. You're going to realize that this is all revealed in the Gospels, that the Gospels tell us. They reveal to us in the mysteries of their differences that the Lord is revealing his is to come, not only from the discourses, not only from the book of Revelation or Daniel, but from the beginning of the Bible to the end. And the Gospels are no different that those differences are prophetic insights to reveal the coming end of days. OK, so to begin to understand that, because today it's probably going to be a little bit over your head. If you're brand new, you're going to want to come right here. This playlist is called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. OK, come to this playlist. Why should you use mirror? And start with these three videos right here. It's a 30 minute Bible study to begin to understand the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to. You're gonna see that Luke is to the bride of Christ. Mark is to the sleeping church. The, it's called the world, right? The house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in. It's, we also call it the sleeping church because within it is those people that claim to believe in Christ but aren't really living for Christ, or they're not watching, they're not praying, they're not repentant, okay? But they claim Christ. And then Matthew is written to the Jews. Matthew is to the seven years of trumpet. So you have the pre-trib of Luke's discourse, which is a pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ to the third heaven. There's gonna be a 50-day period of time play out with a number of things in it, including the 40 days of the Son of Man here. When the 50 days are over, it's going to begin the seven years of seals, which is going to affect the whole earth, but it's going to begin with destruction in Jerusalem to remove them from the land so that they can, so that the land can rest for the next seven years. Because when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion, not feet down on the Mount of Olives, but from above, then in trumpets, 
the the temple and the city and the streets will begin to be rebuilt or will be rebuilt in the first about three and a half years of trumpets. Okay. And so on and so forth. So most of what people believe they understand is only seven years is really the portion of trumpets. And why is that? Because they only understand things from the Gospel of Matthew. So Luke is pre-trib. Mark is pre-trib in the seventh year of seals, is mid-trib in the seventh year of seals. And Matthew at the end of trumpets is when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. The first group goes to the third heaven. The second group goes to paradise. And the third time the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. All right. That's what you're going to begin to understand in here. It's a 30 minute Bible study. There's a six page printout, which you can get in the description box below, or you can go to ministryrevealed.com. And at ministryrevealed.com, everything there is for free. All the videos are one click downloads. Uh, all the charts are there. And same with, uh, 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 you can join us in the forum. So you'll hear me talk about the forum sometimes. That's where we have over 1,100, close to 1,200 people in there from all over the world. We're sharing, we're praying for each other, we're, we're sharing Bible studies, uh, news and events, all sorts of things going on. It's free. You want to hang out and, and share things with like-minded brothers and sisters, you can come and join us in there. It's at ministryrevealed.com. Click on the, description, uh, on the menu and just click on the forum. So these are the things that you're going to begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to. And you're going to see that these differences within the Gospels that are crystal clear differences, people have chalked up to saying, well, it was just perspective. In the is, you can maybe say it's perspective. But in the is to come is where it shines. It reveals the different timings and the different portions to the three different groups, spirit, light, and flesh, Holy Ghost, Jesus, Father, all of their groups within. All right. It's, it's absolutely incredible. The second video is where you'll begin in a 30 minute Bible study to begin to really understand the 14 years. OK, and when you do, you're going to realize, how did we miss this? And the answer is in video number three. It's a big video, but it is going to blow your mind because you're going to see for the first time that the reason the first seven years was missed and the 50 days in the Luke portion is because all of our lives for hundreds of years. We've all been taught from the foundation of Matthew's gospel. So anytime somebody talks prophecy, they always go to Matthew 24, Matthew 24. It's a broken record. It's as if Luke's discourse and Mark's discourse don't even exist because they just think it's viewpoints because they're looking to the is to come through the lens of the is. And they spent all of this time in a perspective that belongs to Matthew, which is to the Jews, and they're only seeing the seven years of trumpets. When you begin to understand that, and it's all revealed in here, it is going to blow your mind. And you're going to begin to finally understand things that have caused so much confusion for centuries in the church is going to start to make itself known to you. It's absolutely incredible. You're going to see that pre, mid, and post are true. You're going to see the seven churches in the end of days and the is to come revealed and understood in their timing. You're going to be able to understand the three discourses, Luke, Mark, and Matthew, in that order, revealing the end of days of the 50 days at the pre-trib, then the seven years of seals, and the seven years of trumpets. It's, it's so incredible. So spend some time in there. It'll be worth every moment of your time. I promise you with all of my heart, It'll be worth every moment of your time and you're going to get excited by it because you're going to begin to understand things that confuse you. And know that you're not alone. All right. You, you weren't the only one confused. Everybody was. It was just kind of set aside because nobody could really grasp it. It's been revealed here in this ministry. And it all started about five and a half years ago. And we're going to touch on that in a moment. So. You know, in this in this revelation of the 21 years, let me just show you uh, an image to give you an idea. You see, the end of days are 21 years. It's the final seven, 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 seven. It's the final sevens of the final Shemitah sevens and then the final Jubilee. 
So in the big picture, it'd be 22. In the picture of the 14th of the 15th year, it's the final Jubilee. In the big picture of all creation, you're going to see that the whole story is a 21,000 year picture. And when it's all done, it's the 21 second, 22nd thousandth year. That is the, the, the eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. It's, it's that crazy. We can prove. And not only that, not only can we prove that the whole story is 21,000 from in the beginning to the very end, and then eternity begins at 22,000, I can prove scripturally that in the beginning was the first month, 16th day of the month. It's absolutely phenomenal. But what you're going to see is that the first seven are quote unquote easy, like Jacob. You know, he worked seven years. They flew by like days because he was so in love and excited to get his bride. Okay. Then he didn't get the Rachel that he wanted. He got Leah. That's because Leah is the older and the older has to be given before the new or the younger. It's all about two different wheat harvests, winter wheat compared to spring wheat. It's phenomenal. Okay, but I want you guys to understand something. We know here in this ministry, the revelation of the 21 years. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because I shared on another with another uh, about another pastor. I'm not a pastor. I'm a teacher, um, but about a pastor, Terry Bennett. And I shared on it a little bit. Uh, I don't know, six, eight, 10, 12, whatever it is months ago. And he had some interesting things, but the timing came and went, and we knew that his years were off anyways. But my question is, you see, Terry Bennett was told that he was given that it was 21 years. He was told that the 21 years began in 2008. 2015, you know, ended and the next one began. And in, I think it was October, he said, that in October of 2022, the final seven years began. Did that guy hear from the Lord? No. You see, so what do you do about somebody like that who, who appears to really love the Lord? And I'm not saying he doesn't love the Lord. Is he purposely deceiving everybody? Maybe there is a little bit of deception going on now. Maybe there is a little bit now because he's refusing to accept that it could not have started yet. You see? Yet he's still telling everybody it started the last seven years began in October 2022. I don't know if you know anything about tribulation, but it's not life as it was every day. Hello. You see, because he believes even in the 21 years that he was given, it's only the final seven years. You see? because they still only understand Matthew. It's the evidence that he's, li he's listening to a lying spirit. Yet he said that he's gone to heaven. The Lord has brought him many times. He's had these visitations. The Lord has spoken to him. But do you know what he can't do? He can't prove the 21 years of scripture. Huh, how about that, right? And then the reason I'm bringing this up is because there was uh, one of our brothers was sharing it just to, to show some, uh, uh, go have a look and to see what I thought. And it was about another pastor. Um, it was Nate and Christy. And I'm sure with their hundreds of thousands and, and the other guys, hundreds of thousands, and both of these guys going around and touring, guess what? Nate has had visitations from the Lord. The Lord has spoken to him and given him visitations and so forth. And guess what Nate was told? 21 years. But Nate was told the first, the first seven began in 2015. Which means the first seven ended, he said, on Feast of Trumpets of 2022. That's closer, isn't it? because we know the truth is 14 years. However, he doesn't believe during this second seven that it's tribulation. He believe it's victory and building. I didn't go into all of it, but it's building it up and preparing things and so forth. 
And then the real tribulation would be the final seven years. You got it because they only know from Matthew. But guess what? If you knew the truth of the 14 years and of the big picture of the 21, you'd be able to show it from Scripture, wouldn't you? None of these guys can do it. They don't have the revelation of the end of days. So what do we do with it? You know, do you realize that somebody like Terry Bennett or even with Nate and Christie, if they admit that, okay, maybe this isn't yet the time, you know, Nate and Christie, they could still get away with it, right? Because they, they've heard 21, but the, the final seven isn't until, what, 2028 or 2029, something like that. So they could still get away with it. But how did the Lord tell one it started in 20, 2008 and the Lord tell the other it started in 2015, gave them both visitations, gave them both words, both shared with them. And Bennett isn't saying, maybe I've misunderstood. Maybe, you know, maybe I needed to check this. I, you see, his entire ministry would be gone. His, all of his speaking engagements would be over. So you see what built up there? Pride. He should lose it all because he's absolutely wrong. What about Nate and Christy? We know the revelation is 14 years. Is it because, is it because Alan here at Ministry Revealed, the guy in Canada up in Calgary sitting in his garage, is it because he's been given a word of the Lord and I've been given all of these visitations and thus saith the Lord? Not a one. Not a single one. Except for one confirmation from the Holy Spirit, which we're going to touch again to share on other things, from Jodel. That's it. Everything else has come, including that, that was a confirmation from Revelation from Scripture. Every single part and piece of the 21-year Revelation and the 14-year revelation after the first seven of ministry revealed has come by the proven word of God. If it was one or two pieces, eh, doesn't really say much, right? We have broken down hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scripture from in the beginning to the end of revelation, and it is proven out 100% of the time that the end of days is two sets of seven years. 100% of the time we have proven it out with scripture. It begins with 50 at the escape. There will be 50 days, then two sets of seven years. It is proven out 100% in scripture. You know, let me give you for anybody, this is just for somebody that's new. Let me show you the most obvious piece of scripture for it. I, 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. What's the above? The 50 days. We have proven that the above is the 50 days. We've known this now for a number of years. So 50 days above 14 years ago, he knew such a one. See, such a one means one that was like a rapture and went to the third heaven. This is the typology of Paul showing the three different groups. The third, first one, above 14 years, which is the start of the 50 days, before the 14 years begins, there is a, like a rapture that goes to the third heaven. Then he says, I knew such a man, meaning like the first one, not the ones that were in Christ, not the Romans eight in Christ ones, but the next group. And this next group, he says, was caught up. This is the Revelation 12. They go to paradise. The third heaven and paradise are both part of the kingdom of God. One is the inner, one is the outer. And then listen to what he says. Remember, he's talking to them about 14 years later. And he says, now the third time, behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. A taking, a taking, a return. Pre, mid, post. 
Luke, Mark, Matthew. Those that are in Christ are spirit-filled. The such a man are those with the light. That's who Jesus came for. And the third is for the flesh and their millennial kingdom. Right here, right here was the beginning of the revelation of the 14 years. You see, guys, I just really want this to sink in. What, what do the people who listen to those pastors, what do they do? What do you do with the Terry Bennett when it's clearly already over? And he's going on tours and he's got thousands and probably tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands over the years through him and his proxies of others that teach his stuff. How on earth can so many people continue to listen to him? Because they don't have discernment. They don't know any different than what the pastor is showing them and a little piece of scripture here and there and here and there, saying the Lord told me this and here's the piece of scripture. And then just everything is just about what the Lord showed them and what the Lord told them and what they saw when they went. You see, I don't hate Terry. I love Terry. I believe he's a brother in Christ, but he's deceived. And everybody watching has no idea because they don't have discernment either. So why don't they leave, right? Otherwise, you would think they would leave. And now, so the reason this, I, I just wanted to bring this up was because now I heard about this other one with, um, with Nate and Christy. And even though they're closer, they're still wrong. The end of days is seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. So to me, I, you know, it's somewhat exciting to hear that people have heard 21 years. Kind of, <laughs> you see, but we have proven that neither of them can show it with scripture because everything they know is from Matthew. We haven't had visitations. We haven't had thus saith the Lord. We have had revelation. This is the revelation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know why it's coming through this ministry and this guy sitting in his garage. But the evidence is in the fact that we show scripture after scripture after scripture. And I show it to each and every one of you diligently seeking the Lord to follow it and to track it and to understand it for yourselves. And when you do, guess what happens? You all send me emails, comments, posts and say, oh, my goodness, now I understand. Now I can see. Now I know why these differences in the Gospels. And everything starts to open up in Scripture. Do we know absolutely everything? No. But it is the revelation. It is a continuous revelation until he makes it known to his remnant bride workers, which are the Luke remnant bride workers that are going to be with him for 40 days, and be here at least during the time of seals to help bring in the great multitude rapture. It's, it's incredible. But what do we do to those? How, how can we help the others? It's almost impossible, isn't it? Right? It's almost impossible. One of our brothers was saying, saying that he was sharing too, um, who had shared Nate and Christy, and he was watching with Ministry Revealed for a bit. And then when a time came and went or a time came and went and people were like, ah, forget it, I'm going back and they'll go listen to somebody else. You see, that's not really a watchman now, is it? That's just somebody looking for the date. Are those people just looking for the date actually going to be ready when the Lord comes? Because just watching for a date isn't it. Do we watch for dates? Do we talk about dates here? Absolutely, because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that is directing us to them. Brothers and sisters, this is from the word of God revealed. That's what it is. There's no way around it. Not a little bit, not kind of, not maybe. Proven by thousands of hours of scriptures being revealed video after video after video, 
scripture after scripture, chapter after chapter, book after book. So you can all see it for yourselves. It's just awesome. Now, let me explain. And I'm going to share a little something. You know, I, I've had a couple people email me this recently as well. Maybe like three people actually email or comment me about this. And that is, they, they wonder at the possibility that the Revelation 12 sign, quote unquote, of September of 2017 was the actual beginning of these first seven years. Okay, because this year would be the end of the sixth, which would mean there's only one more year to go. Now, do I believe it's possible? No, not really. Is it maybe in the back of my mind? Sure. Why is it in the back of my mind? Well, for one, because, and please don't say, oh, Alan's thinking 2024. No, I am not. I'm going to show you guys that it's not. But it's, you know, what about, you know, it was such a big thing. It went around the whole world, right? Millions of people were watching for it. Um, how about uh, uh, um, in myself? You know, myself, I had um, in this video, this is where it all started for me, okay? On September 8th, 2017 was when I began to know something had just dawned on me and I said, oh my goodness. You know, I, I think I just noticed something. If there, and you know, if there was anything from it, I was gonna come back and show it to you guys. This was the moment that everything in my life changed and I started doing this. About five months later, this became what I was doing full time because it was clear that the revelation of the end of days was being revealed. And I want you to hear it here in this video. This was September 8, 2017. To the man-child thing right now. But we are caught up. So when are we caught up? Well, we're caught up after we see these things. You know, when is, um, when, when we look at a lot of the uh, uh, Old Testament stuff, and even some of the New Testament, you know, in Isaiah 66, before she travailed, before, you know, and, and that's the case. When we look at some of these, then we would be gone before. So what is this part here? And you know what? Something just struck me as I'm reading this, but I'm not going to go into it right now. <laughs> I love that piece. I'm reading it. I was talking about Revelation. Let me go to Revelation because we're going to go there. I was talking about Revelation chapter 12. And everybody, right, we were talking about the Revelation 12 sign. It was September 8th. And I, at this point, I didn't know the 14 years. I didn't know the Revelation of the Gospels. This was where everything changed. And I was talking about the was caught up. Remember? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the was caught up was the rapture group to paradise, the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. But when we go to Isaiah 66, 7, it said before she travailed. And that's what I was talking about in the video. I said, before she travailed. And I, and I said, then that means we would go up here. And I just said, wait a second. I just noticed something, you know, and I'm like, I'm not going there now. I'll come back, right? Because the travailing is over here. How can this be the rapture of the pre-trib if the travailing is here? And one of the scriptures everybody points to is Isaiah 66, 7, that before she travailed, she brought forth. It suddenly didn't make sense, and it dawned on me. And that was the beginning of it all. It was pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. The whole story, right? And so it was awesome. But what had happened was right around the time of this video, it was in, um, it was maybe late August, early-ish uh, uh, September. I told you guys this story in the past. I ran into this homeless guy going to one of the big bookstores not far from where I lived, and they had a Starbucks attached to it. I used to always go there for Starbucks. You know me and my coffee, although I'm not a Starbucks guy anymore. And what had happened was I was going in, and there was, there was this homeless-looking guy there. And so, you know, I thought, oh, whatever I had in my pocket, and I had a few bucks in my pocket, I, I gave him everything that I had, and we started talking. And we started talking about the Lord, and he was on fire for the Lord, like I had never seen a homeless person before. And he had this very righteous indignation at these Christians walking by 
that, that were coming from church that would just ignore them. They wouldn't even give them the time of day. And, and as a Christian, and he was speaking as a Christian, they just ignored him and kept walking. And when I got there and I shared with them and I gave him some help and we started talking, he was telling me about it. And we started to have this whole conversation. And I said, and this is how I know the timing because I started talking to him about the Revelation 12 sign. And we were, we were talking maybe 15 minutes or so and hanging out. And, you know, it was all about the Lord. And he was very passionate. And he knew his scriptures. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, a lot of homeless people somewhat know or claim to believe in Christ. But this guy knew his word as well. And his name was John. And when, I fin uh, when we were talking... And I told him about the, the Revelation 12 sign that I believe this is the pre-trib, the rapture's coming. You know, I was all excited for it. And he told me, well, you know, even if it isn't, we need to always be ready and watching, right? And I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, I know that's always true, right? And so we had left. We said goodbye. He didn't want a coffee. I went in to get a coffee. And as I, I could still picture it today, as I'm grabbing the handle to go into the, into the Starbucks, I'm thinking to myself, what does this guy know? Not going to be the Revelation 12 sign. It's the Revelation 12 sign. Look at it. Right. I'm thinking of this in my head. Oh, this guy doesn't know. But, you know, he still loves the Lord. He'll be ready anyways. Right. And lo and behold, of course, nothing happened. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because one, he said that two, his name is John. And three, he had this very righteous indignation for the Lord. And how others, when they see a brother or a sister and they need help, they're supposed to help, right? That's what we should do to, to the best of our ability, right? To, to some extent. And nobody was doing anything until I came and then the whole story started. Well, it was right around this time that I received an understanding that things were going on in Scripture. And this video on September 8th, was that moment it's pretty wild so why why did this john guy become potentially this quite a character in my life well because i met him about four or five times in total the second time um i think the second time i met him again on my own or the third time and the second time was with my son and i saw that he was there and my son i introduced him to him and we chatted and so forth just regular conversation the third time i meet him he says, next time we get together, we should grab a bite to eat. And I thought that was kind of interesting, right? Because I started having my suspicions about this guy because the September 12th thing, a September 23rd thing had come and gone. And I, I, I you know, I, I started getting a little suspicious about him because of certain things he was saying. And then the fourth time I meet him, I was with my wife, the fourth or fifth. I was with my wife. And so the eating part, of course, is interesting because of what we know for the workers and so forth or going to the third heaven at the banquet. So this has become a lot more interesting. And then the, the last time I met him, I was with my wife. And I know what we were studying at the time because of what my wife said after we left. We were talking with them, just having conversations, you know, in the Lord and so forth. And he said that he was trying to get enough money to go back. I think he was, his family was in Vancouver. So he was saying he was trying to get some, some money to go back to Vancouver, listen to this, for his birthday. And he says, because my birthday is Christmas on December 25th. And I thought, oh man, that'd be so exciting, right? And so we had said goodbyes, I left. And as we're walking, I could still see this today. As we're walking back to the vehicle, my wife turns to me and she says, did you catch it? I'm like, what do you mean? Did you catch it? His birthday was December 25th at Christmas. Here I was for a few months, suspicious, suspicious of this guy being a John, being maybe John, maybe literally being the Apostle John. You know, maybe just an angelic, right? Maybe the angel, you know, spirit filled and so forth. Never knowing if you're entertaining angels. But his name was John. He said, let's eat the next time together. He had this righteous indignation. 
And then he said his birthday was December 25th. And how I know what we were studying at that time is the fact that my wife said that to me, which means at that time he ta that he told us and my wife caught it, it's because at that time, about four or five years ago, it meant that that's when we were studying and going back and forth on when John was born and when Jesus was born. Was John or Jesus born at around Christmas time? And was Jesus or John born at the time of the Feast of Weeks? That's what the conversation had been. And that's why my wife caught it. So it was pretty darn interesting. And the reason I'm sharing it is because as we go further into this today, the conversation and the revelation is to the birth of Christ, which is going to be proven here today, which, by the way, about four, four and a half, something like that years ago, we had this conversation at the birth of Christ on this date that I'm going to share with you from another video called the Star of Bethlehem by a lawyer who had studied it and revealed it and came to understand it. And he went on tour all around North America and probably even different parts of the world showing the revelation of the Star of Bethlehem. And he had that same date. So as we've now come full circle and we're at this point and we're connecting it to the time of the, Christ, the birth of Christ, which is all about this revelation of the timing of when for this year, guess what that means? John was born at Christmas. <laughs> you see, we have pieces of scripture that are pretty wild too, don't we? What do we know about John? You see, how about this one? In John chapter 21, now remember, what's the typology of John chapter 21? Well, this is the is, right? So when you, anybody that's new, when you hear me talking about the was, is, and is to come, the was is the Old Testament. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib escape. And then that begins the is to come. Okay? That's why you have in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 1.9, it says um, what was shall be, meaning is to come. And what is shall be, which means is to come. Which means in the was of the Old Testament, in the is of the New Testament, reveals the is to come which means the scripture must be filled with types and shadows revealing the revelation of the end. And that is exactly what has been happening here for five and a half years. Well, John 21 is no different. John 21 is, of course, from the time of Christ. However, we know that the Gospel of John in 21 chapters, you think maybe there's a reason the only book in the New Testament with 21 chapters? Do you think maybe there's a clue? Darn right there's a clue because it reveals the is to come in the chapters within it representing each of them as a year. So what do we see here? The Lord, right? He returned after his resurrection. So this is like at the tail end of the whole story. But what is it in the 20, 21st chapter of, of, the book of, uh, uh, of the book of John in the is to come? It's the end of the story. You see, it's the same end. And listen to what it says. It says, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify. Verse 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved. That, of course, was John the Apostle. Uh, that was following. Which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, uh, Peter seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Right? Talking about John. What shall this man do? Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Thou follow me. Right? That's kind of interesting. That means there's a possibility that John is still here. You know, at Patmos, there is no record of John's death, by the way, for those that didn't know that. There is no recorded death of the Apostle John, even after the book of Revelation in Patmos. And then verse 23 says, Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, 
what is it to thee? You see, that doesn't change anything. He's just saying, I didn't say he wouldn't die, meaning at the end of it all, it doesn't mean he's not going to die. I'm just saying he's going to remain here until I come. Hello. Think the possibility that John's still here? <laughs> I got to admit, I do. Maybe he was it was just the spirit and an angelic thing. But I believe he was John. And everything that he said, I believe he was John. But I'm not saying it absolutely was. But oh my goodness, <laughs> it's pretty wild. You see, if we go to Revelation chapter 10, we see the same thing in Revelation chapter 10, right? Here's the seventh angel of the seventh trumpet. So at the end of 14 years, do you know that John, do you know that John chapter 21 is the end of 14 years? It's the end of the big picture 21 of which easy seven and then 14 years. It's the seventh trumpet, the end of the seventh trumpet. <laughs> and so look at what we see here. It says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, right? Like Daniel uh, 12, because it's the end of the 13th and the start of the 14th. And then he tells him some info. And then what? It's, it's the typology of being at the end of the 14th year or the 14,000th and so forth, right? Or 21,000th. Uh, verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand, the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall be in thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Hello. Hello. You realize he was in Patmos, right? He was in Patmos. The angel told him, look, you're still about to go out and you're going to continue prophesying to many angels, kings, all, all sorts. I mean, uh, um, uh, people's nations, tongues and kings. And then you got the same timing of this in the typology of chapters to years. Where the Lord said, I didn't say he wouldn't die. I just said, what is it to you if he's here till I return? I wonder, I wonder if it was something given to John to give me the revelation because it was right around this period of time. Because at the first meeting, I told him all about the Revelation 12 sign. To which he said, well, even if it isn't, we always need to be prepared and watching. Man, that blows me away. I just thought that was fun. I really wanted to share that with you guys. So the next piece I wanted to get into is the Jodel part. You see, that began it all for me. That's where we knew everything, where I knew it all started. Was the spirit already working in me prior to that? I believe so, because the very first video was all about the mark of the beast, right? People have said it was the best revelation of the mark of the beast they'd ever seen. And so, you know, I believe that the spirit was already working, but I knew at this point, everything had changed. Everything had changed. And then what happened? Well, then on March 10th of 2020, so between September and March of, 20, uh, of 2017 to March of 2020, all of this revelation started to come about, of which we were also digging seeking and searching the true understanding of 70 years. So when times came and went and a year came, we were always looking to the next event based on it, believing that it was still the 70th year. So every year we've been believing, oh, it's the 70th year because of this calculation or based on the 70th year because of this calculation. It wasn't until about two years ago we received the understanding of the calculation 
We just didn't properly discern it because you never want to look two years out, right? You're more interested in, in the year that you're in or the year that's upcoming, okay? Now we've gone to the extent. We know this is the 70th year. So knowing this is the 70th year, that's why we're, we're highly watching. But more than that, it's all the revelation that has come since. All the revelation that is built up to this time, proving that the beginning is 100% connected to Taurus. 100%. And so if it doesn't happen in this time frame in, in Nissan, or, or sorry, in Savan, then guess what? You got another year to go at least. Do I believe that's the case? No. And that's why, before we get into this, that's why in Revelation 12, you know, it, it could be said, right? I mean, I woke up in September in, in massive amount with the revelation being having begun. So is it possible? <laughs> I sure hope not. And according to scripture, it isn't. You see, these were man events that they noticed. But what do we know about this quote unquote Revelation 12 time? It wasn't the actual event. A lot of people were waking up in that time because they were looking for it. But the vast majority of them went back to sleep because it wasn't quote unquote the pre-trip. So they went back to sleep. So was it really the Revelation 12 sign? No. Could it have been a precursor to get people waking up? Sure. Does it mean it had to be the seven years of the beginning of the 21? No. Let me show you. Because later in September of 2017, I was sharing this in videos. Listen to what it says in Revelation 12.1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, okay? A woman clothed with the sun, so on and so forth. So listen to the word appear. Here's the definition of the word appear. So we were told that the Revelation 12 sign was the, the sun, moon, and stars, and, and that alignment that was there, all right? Which means the only way you could see it is if you use stellarium or if you, you had some sort of program to see where the, the sun and the moon were, because, I mean, you can't see it when the sun's there, right? So the, then the sun wouldn't have been there when you were looking, you know, and it's evening time, you wouldn't have been able to see it. It was impossible to actually see the quote-unquote Revelation 12 sign. Well, in late September of 2017, I showed the definition of the word appeared. Listen to what it says. To gaze, that is, with eyes wide open, as at something remarkable. Was that what happened on September 23rd, 2017? No. You couldn't see it. And thus differing from G991, which denotes, listen to this, simply voluntary observation, and from G1492, which expresses merely technical, or sorry, merely mechanical, passive, or casual vision. Doesn't that, doesn't all of this envelop the Revelation 12 sign? It was a simple voluntary observation. You couldn't see it. Unless it was mechanical, although this means just mechanically looking, you know, like you normally would. Or casual vision. We are told that this appearing is not simply voluntary observation. is not merely mechanical, casual vision. We are told that it means to gaze at something with eyes wide open, which is something remarkable. That was not the Revelation 12 sign of September 23rd. So do I believe that that needs to be a counter for the first seven years? No, I do not. Because it wasn't the actual Revelation 12 one sign. This Revelation 12 one sign is more than likely, probably most, 
highly certain that this Revelation 12 1 sign is going to be Luke 21 25 through 26. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. You see, the sun, the moon, and stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. What do we know about this? This is the stone's throw that we have revealed. The stone's throw. When does the stone's throw come? The stone's throw comes during maybe maybe a, a couple days before, but most certainly during the first seven days while the wedding of the pre-trib is happening in the third heaven. This is the sign of Luke chapter 21, men's hearts failing them. It's the stone's throw. It's these meteors coming. This is the sign. This is the same as going to the seven churches, and this is Ephesus, which represents those first eight days. Yes, they continue through, but represents the first eight days, which is just like what? Like the Ephesians and their idolatry of worshiping the, the goddess, where they say uh, uh, Artemis, but they've called it Diana in scripture, which is what? the idol made from a meteor that landed in Ephesus. This is the typology of the timing of the first week of the 50 days while the wedding is taking place in heaven. And then the travailing in birth, as we've shared before, is the 40 days of the Son of Man. This has not happened yet. All right. So I don't believe now. Am I saying 100 percent? No, that Revelation 12 of September. Was it maybe a precursor to get people watching? And could it have been the beginning of the, you know, the time frame of the beginning of the first seven? The reason I don't completely dismiss it. Is because when the revelation started for me. So I'm not going to completely dismiss it. But am I sitting here telling you guys, I believe it is, and this isn't really the 70th, and don't worry, we don't need to count the understanding of the 70th. No. I absolutely believe this is the true 70th year. Because you know what it means otherwise? After all the revelation, and the revelation you're going to see tonight, even more clearly, it means you're never going to hear of another high watch date from Ministry Revealed until spring of next year. And some people might be saying, yay, we can just focus on all the scriptures and just keep going. No, you know why that's not yay? Because a lot of people come to watch an understanding of a time frame. because a lot of people are going through a lot of crap, right? A lot of people just want to go be with the Lord. Yes, they're diligent, they, they want to seek the Lord, but they just want to go. A lot of people have some serious health issues. I know of some here in our, with, with our brothers and sisters. Right? A lot of people having a hard time. I most certainly don't want to be the one to say, hey, we've got another year to go. But you're not going to get that from me. Why? Because this is the year. This is the 70th. The last video, I showed it to you even more. This is the 70th. Not because I say so, but because Scripture has proven it. All right? So now let's go to the next piece. Let's listen to the first, oh, almost two minutes in this part here, and then we'll come back. This video was done, pay attention, on March 10th, 2020. This was the video that I did that the Holy Ghost confirmed to me. You'll remember, and many of you guys know the story, I have a lot of like, Little, you know, I don't know if you want to call them word of knowledge. I don't even know how that works. But where I'm pondering, I'm in the shower and I'm pondering and I'm asking the Lord and I'm in, I'm, I'm in praise. I'm in, I'm in thought. I'm in question. I'm, I'm considering the scriptures. And as I'm seeking the Lord on something, it happens regularly, but not all the time, not often. And all of a sudden, 
in my spirit, I suddenly understand something to what I was seeking. All right, it happens a lot. Well, what had happened is this video was done. And listen to the title of the video. After the 50th, the tribulation begins this year. It was all about the revelation of the 14 years and the 50th of Jubilee that follows at the end, but also the 50 days of Pentecost that come first. But at this time, I didn't fully yet understand. It wasn't until a few months later that Feast of Weeks and Pentecost are two separate things. Okay, so when you hear me talk about a piece in here, I haven't yet realized that Feast of Weeks and Pentecost are two different things, okay? But it was after the 50th of Pentecost, tribulation begins. Well, that's the truth. When the 50 days of Pentecost come to an end, which will begin their count from the moral after the seventh Sabbath, when those 50 days end, the tribulation begins. And I thought this was going to happen in 2020. But, on March 10th, we believed was the potential for the time of the escape. And when it did happen and I was doing studying, I got this revelation. And the reason that, we, that I believed that it was going to be March 10th was because the count from Israel becoming a nation. Okay? We know that they didn't have a government until they had their elections in January of 1949, but they didn't plant until February. And he didn't take over office in, until uh, March 8th of 1949. They needed a government before it was all official. So it wasn't until March 8th, but <laughs> they had a temporary agreement in place, a provisional government. And he ripped up the letter of the provisional government on March 10th of 1949. And so believing that that was the connection and in the way to count it, this would have been the latest to the 70th year because now it would have been at the start coming into the start of the 71st. I believe that this was the date that we were looking at. When it came and went and I had done this video because it should have been the night before the 10th and I started studying and I put this video together, I was freaking out because I suddenly realized the connection to the, the, the Hebrew number 14, which is noon, and that it equaled 50. And that's what this revelation was about, that the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet equaled was the word noon, which is where the revelation came from in, in, uh, in Numbers chapter 13. And noon, which is the 14th letter, equaled 50. And it was the revelation of the end of days, 14 years, 50th Jubilee. <coughs> and we know there's a 50 day count that comes before it. 50 days, 14 years, 50th Jubilee year. It was the revelation of the end of days. <clears throat> and look at this title. So I freaked out after I did the video. I had a shower, it was about 11.45 at night and I said, Lord, I'm taking this video down. I said, I need you to confirm. And it was in a, it was in a tone and in a, in a, in a, a passion that I, I've never really had. I was really concerned for what I was saying. And so I said, Lord, I need you to let me know. I need a confirmation either tonight or by tomorrow morning when I wake up, I'm gonna see it. And I want it to be two things. I want you to confirm it to me by showing me a number 50 that I'm gonna see it, I'm gonna understand it when I see that 50 and that you let me know that I was on target, that I'm on track, that I've understood these things. Do those two things and I will leave the video up. You see, did it even happen that year? No, but guess what? It was so important that this video stay up. And this is why when it happened to me, I was in tears, I was freaking out. I, I went downstairs, I was, it was about one o'clock in the morning when I saw an email come in. I was watching a show one o'clock in the morning, settling down after doing this video and praying about it and freaking out. And I saw as I was watching a show about one o'clock in the morning, my phone was blinking a little blue light. I see that there was an email and I'm going to get to it in a moment. And when I saw that email, I had a little flutter in my heart. My, my heart just jumped. 
And I knew because of the title of that email that I was going to receive what I had prayed for. But I want you guys to listen to what was said in a couple parts here in this video. You know, it goes on to talk about there's not a lot of places where it's, I mean, there's a few, but there's not a lot of places where it directly says 14, 14, 14. But he goes on to say there's a lot of situations, like a lot of, of stories where you see the 14. Exactly. And you find out that numerically, noon is 50 or Pentecost, which leads to what I would like to propose the number 14 means in scripture, which is something new starting. Pentecost was the beginning of the church, right? It was the beginning of everything when there was the new anointing. There, did you hear that? Not only is it believed to be like the, the new beginning, the starting of everything, but at Pentecost, not, not Feast of Weeks, but Pentecost, 50 days later, was the beginning of the church, brothers and sisters. Was the beginning of the church, brothers and sisters. The reason I'm bringing this piece up for you is because not only the story of what happened on this date <clears throat> and the email that came from her, but the beginning of the church, which is what? Mark. Jesus said he came <clears throat> for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those who are spirit filled, like the Luke group, like the, the creation in the beginning group, they are spirit-filled Romans 8 people. They're the ones in Christ, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the ones that were in Christ that went pre-trib above 14 years to the, to the third heaven. Christ didn't come for those people. Those people are about to be removed and the tribulation will begin with the Lord coming to wake up and prepare the ones he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When did the church age begin for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Pentecost. Do you, know, do you, do you understand those who watched the last video why it's so important? We know Pentecost didn't begin here. The Feast of Weeks began either here <coughs> or it began here. Which makes the Feast of Weeks the seventh Sabbath here or the seventh Sabbath here. And then what? Then the 50 days or 50 days from here. One of those two. Because it was from the 50 days at the end of the 50 days was what? The beginning of the church age. This is why at the father's birthday, right? Like the little girl said, at the father's birthday, she couldn't quite understand because they were asking Jesus and said, my father's birthday, right? His special day. What is the father's special day? The feast of weeks. It's the feast of weeks. It's always been the feast of weeks. We know it's the feast of weeks, and I'm going to show you why that's so important in a minute. But this is why I wanted to show that piece of that clip. Because just like the church, it started at the end of Pentecost. The 14 years of tribulation, the beginning of Mark's portion, is going to begin at Pentecost. Doesn't it totally make sense now that the 50 days that we've been counting from John into Luke into Acts 1, Acts 2 is the 50 days. Then at Pentecost, after they get the anointing, bang, the 14 years begin. It's not at the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks was the beginning of the count. Which means we had to reach 70 to the Lord God. At what? The Feast of Weeks. Listen to this. Let's go to this portion of the video right here. And listen to what I say here. Before that, the 70 weeks are Pentecost, are the Jubilee. They are days and they are years. That is where the Lord is counting it from. So, bam! In this video, on March 10th, 2020, 
not only was it the revelation confirming from the, the letter and number noon equaling 14 and 50, showing that there were 50 days of Pentecost first, then the 14 years, then the 50th Jubilee, but also in the video, I said, now we know where the Lord God is counting from. Now do you understand why this was so important? Do you understand why out of all the videos, out of the whole five and a half years of everything I was doing and all the revelation, the Holy Spirit came to confirm this one video. This one video. Do you know how that video came about? You see the video, oops, right here. You see the, the 14 years? What had happened, it was, let me show on this one. The alphabet, right? What do we know about the Hebrew alphabet? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. It goes up to 400. These are what are called the finals. We're going to talk on those a little bit later as well. So what's 14? It's noon. The 14th letter equals 50. And, and why was this important? How did this come about? It came about because of a revelation when I noticed in Numbers chapter 14, uh, 13 about the tribe of Ephraim and its Osi who is Hosea, right? Which means Yeshua, the deliverer. His father was Noon. Noon means perpetuity. Okay, it was Joshua, Yeshua's father. And so you come down here and we see the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshi, the son of Nun, Yeshua. He changes his name from Osi or Hosea to Yeshua. It is absolutely a typology of Christ. And it was connected to Nun. And when I saw this, I said, wait a second. I know that number noon. Noon, it turns out, is the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it equals 50. And this revelation right here is what brought about <clears throat> the full understanding of the code of the end of days, which was 50 days of the Pentecost count, 14 years, seven of seals, seven of trumpets and the final 50th Jubilee. All of these things were connected to this video on March 10th. And at 11.30, 11.45 at night, when I was praying this, everyone in my house was asleep. I was praying this and having this discussion with the Lord. Nobody on earth knew. I didn't pray it out loud. It was in my thoughts and my whole house was asleep. Okay? And then what happened? Well, remember in this video, what did it show? What we spoke about in the last one. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Know therefore and understand from the going forth. Whoops. Yeah. Know therefore and understand that the going forth of the commandment to rebuild. Which we know during the 50 days, <laughs> Jerusalem is going to be attacked and destroyed. So if they're going to be attacked and destroyed, that means the commandment to rebuild is going to happen within a period of time before the 14 weeks, uh, the 14 years begin, which was what? After the Feast of Weeks. So it's Feast of Weeks, then 50 days to Pentecost, and bam, the 14 years, just like the New Testament. The story began at the, at the anointing of the Holy Ghost because without the Holy Ghost, none of us could have received the truth of what Christ did. We need the Holy Ghost to dwell within us to reveal it. So when did the New Testament really officially begin? Well, there's two kind of things, right? At the resurrection of Christ and at the Holy Ghost. At Pentecost. Hello. Couldn't have one without the other, though. Well, Pentecost, we know now, 
is not the Feast of Weeks. It's the Feast of Weeks and then the 50 days. <laughs> so what's really funny about this is it's still kind of saying the same thing. Because I was saying from the 50 weeks, right? I mean, um, from the, the 50 count of Pentecost, from the Feast of Weeks, right? Count 50 days and then the 14 year start. It's, it's kind of like saying the same thing. But the truth is, it's seven Sabbaths from either Resurrection Day or the week after to begin the seven Sabbaths count. And when you get to it, this year will be the end of 70 years as we've been sharing. Then it's the 50 where they're attacked and destroyed by the 50th day. Then the 14 years begin. So knowing this now, seeing it, having it clear, <clears throat> can we prove the timing of this? Can we show really that this is the understanding? And to be able to do so, we got to do it with scripture. We got to do it with history. We got to do it maybe with the sun, moon, and stars, right? Well, let me share with you what it was that Jodell sent me. This was the header. When I saw this in my email, when the light was flashing, your last video, very important. I'd never received anything like this from her, ever. I think I'd only received maybe two or three emails from her before this. Nothing like this ever at all. Look at when it came in. March 11th, 2020 at 1240 a.m. Just like three hours, I mean, uh, uh, an hour after I had prayed it. An hour after I had prayed it, but I didn't see it till 1 a.m. And when I read it, I freaked out, woke my wife up at quarter after one in the morning. I was freaking out. I was in tears. I was going through it all. I was explaining it. And we were freaking out together. I knew this was going to be it. And listen to what she says. Hey, Alan, this email message is totally guided by the Holy Spirit, which I say with full regard to that statement and the implications that come with making such a claim. You see that? Right off the bat, she's telling me it's the Holy Spirit that has led her in this. And she knows what the punishment means. She knows what it means for making a false claim of such, of such power from the Holy Spirit. With that said, I have never experienced what, I'm, what I experienced tonight. So to this, ex, to this extreme, tonight watching your video, which was becoming physically ill, vomiting and more. Why? Because she was being spiritually attacked to prevent her from receiving what, guess what? You understand, this is why I cry. This is why I freak out with these things. Because do you know what it means when something like this happens? This means the Lord God Father instructed the Holy Ghost to give it to Jodell to give me the message. Do you know how mind-blowing that is? Of course it puts me off, off the rails, man. I just, you freak out. It means the Lord Father God himself said, go give him this because that video, that revelation he's received is too important. We cannot take it away. It'll be what is needed to continue the revelation of everything else going forward. Just think about it, guys. Do you know that from it, we even got the revelation of the entirety of creations? Right? We know when creation started, the, the, the number of years. We know the date because of this. We know why John had in the beginning and, Luke, uh, and Genesis have in the beginning. <clears throat> and in the beginning was the word, was the spirit. Then he became light and then he was made flesh. We know that Jesus is a type of Adam, right? He's called the last Adam. You see? And then she says, I've experienced these episodes before when I was given the truth either to a question that I had or while studying the word and referred to this reaction uh, to this reaction as a spiritual attack as I can actually feel something attacking me when I get close to an understanding or a deep knowledge of a hidden truth or message. This happened around the 50 minute mark 
when you were revealing the truth about the sevens, especially the alphabet. Listen to this. Let me go to the video and let's listen to some in the time frame of the 50 minute mark and tell me if you hear anything special going on. Certain times when one will end and another will start or where some one will continue and another one will overlap and it'll, it'll be more while the other one tapers off. It's not just one and then the other and then the other and then the other year after year. No, they're all going out. But they will have their effects. Some stop, some start, some overlap. Okay? When this red one goes out, it said power was given to him to take what? To take. See that? There was nothing going on special. These were things that we've known and that we've talked about before. But it's because I asked for a 50 connection that I would see it and I would understand when I received the confirmation. There was my 50 minute. I was looking for the number 50 that would catch my attention. And then listen to what, what she said. It literally took me hours to settle down after watching your video. Do you know what that means? That means the Lord was giving her the revelation or gave her this word for me before I had even prayed for it. That blew me away too. And then what? She had to settle down. She had to take a rest and nap for a little bit because she was so overwhelmed, so overcome, and so just exhausted from what had happened. Why do you think that was? Because I hadn't yet prayed it. And I knew immediately that I was supposed to let you know that you are, in quotations, right on target. What did I pray for? Let me know by a con confirmation with the number 50 that I would understand and catch it, and to let me know that I was understanding, that I was on target, that I was on track. And the Spirit says to tell me, right on target. One thing that stood out, listen to this. <clears throat> One thing that stood out was the fact about Israel being attacked, and it hung in my mind even after settling down. In 2017, when I was woken up, I used to get these messages, and these messages were answers to questions. I would fall asleep only to, to nap for like an hour or two. And when I would wake on my computer would be the answer, usually in video format, as I learn visually the best. Well, this is what happened tonight. The video that was on my screen was this link. She has the one below. And I felt, no, I knew that I was supposed to send this link to you and also tell you about my experiences tonight. As I started this email, this is not just from me, but, I'm, but I know for sure that it is from the Holy Spirit as I couldn't miss this feeling of contacting you. You will know the relevance per what to do with this information, apparently. This video is from 2010 and relates information as far back as 2005. Keep this in mind when you're viewing it. Tell me I wasn't supposed to freak out receiving this. And the key was what? That the Spirit gave me the words right on target. So right on target, the number 50, that means I couldn't take the video down. What was in that video was understood. But she also woke up to another video that popped on her screen that she had never seen before. And it was the main feature video right there in her face when she woke up after her nap. And she knew that she had to give it to me too and that somehow I would apparently understand it. Well, <clears throat> let's have a peek at that video. Watch this. Let's watch it for a few minutes. Listen to this. It's going to blow your mind. To try and roll out the sequence of events. Now, what he described... Oh, and I want you to know, this is from 2010. Listen to this. June 18th, 2010. Do you know I started my ministry on the 16th, 17th of June, 2017, but then knew something was happening on September 8th. <clears throat> Do you know that that little girl that, that we shared, that the Lord had told her, you know, that we're going after my father's birthday, and that video was, I think, June 6th of 2012. And what you're going to see tonight 
is the evidence of June connected also to the birth of Christ, to the Feast of Weeks. June, 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 June. But remember, this is from 2010. And he's talking about a guy who was a high up in military over in the UK who was in this meeting <clears throat> who wasn't supposed to be invited, but he was on a list for other things and he was invited. Remember, the Holy Spirit wanted her to share this with me as well. Why is this important and why is it connected? This video that the Spirit was confirming was from 2010. In the very early mornings at 12.40 a.m. on March 11th, she got the word from the Spirit for me. Well, actually before that, and then she sent this to me. And within it was this video that was for me to understand as well. Listen to why. What the sequence of events was. It starts with Israel attacking Iran. No, this hasn't happened yet. There have been a number of indications that, that, that there are forces which are trying to, to, to push this into happening. You've only got to follow the news for the last two years to realize that the public is being prepared for a justification for this kind of thing. Iran is being set up as being the bad guys that deserve something to happen to them, and so on and so forth. Now, that's going to be the start of what is like the opening gambit in a big chess game. And the plan is to provoke Iran or China to retaliate. And our guy, our source, who is a military man, is privately as convinced as he can be, although this has never been made public and this is not publicly known, that Iran does have nuclear weapons. He believes that they have been provided by China behind the scenes. And all of this is intended because it's all right with these controlling forces that Iran has nuclear weapons because they want them to be used. The plan is for either Iran or for China to retaliate after Iran is struck with a nuclear weapon. At that point, there will be a limited nuclear exchange in the Middle East, followed by a ceasefire. He heard this being planned in this meeting. This is being... <laughs> Now, you guys that have been here for a while know that I have taught on this, that the first attack is in northern Israel with Iran. It's going to be a short Middle East war. Because why? Because in Daniel 7, I mean, in Daniel 9, we know from the Feast of Weeks and the beginning of the 50 days, there's going to be an attack that begins. And then there'll be a later attack at the end of 50 days that destroys Jerusalem. This is what's going to call for the commandment to allow them to go and restore. They're going to settle. It's the first attack with Iran in the Middle East is going to be a very short-lived war. But it's going to be devastating. We knew this and taught on this before we received this from Jodel. Listen to what else he says. In choreograph. It's like the script for a movie. This is exactly what's intended to happen. And during this time, the other thing that's being set up for this, and many people watching this will be aware that this is being set up in the background. We've had a lot of information about this from a number of good researchers from many countries who are reporting this on the internet, that things are being set up in many of the Western countries for there to be heavy controls over populations, martial law, increased powers on um, security forces who are not just the, uh, the army or the police, but in Britain, for example, our source said that he knew, he absolutely knew personally for a fact, that a very large number of private security people, their powers were being increased to give them um, the ability to arrest people, the ability to detain, the ability to handle riots in streets. And here we're talking about just regular people working in private security, people who give a parking tickets on the streets. Their powers are being increased in the same way. And uh, last year, we heard President Obama talking about how he wanted to have a sort of national guard at home in America ready to handle this kind of thing. There are a lot of indicators that this is being set up. And in this rollout of this crazy scenario where it is intended that there will be a limited nuclear exchange in the Middle East, the idea is that as the world looks upon this with horror, then they will demand from their governments that there are heavy controls over travel, over communication, over people who meet, over people who protest in the streets. They want to make sure that they don't have uh, crazy bombers on airplanes, crazy bombers in the shopping malls. They want to make sure. And because people will be driven into fear by this, they'll request and demand and insist on heavy controls from their governments, which will be justified. And this is where you're going to kind of get the martial law situation in all the Western countries. It's intended as a justification. All of this is just the start of something, because the story gets much bigger. And it's pretty horrifying. And if watching this now, you're feeling a little bit shocked. This is how I was feeling when I heard this information. And this is how our source was feeling when he was hearing this information in this meeting, because this is just the beginning. Now, during the time of the ceasefire, everyone's shocked, everyone's frightened, everyone's really terrified about where this is going to go. There are all kinds of heavy controls over populations everywhere. And then the next thing that happens in this, in this chess game that's being played is that biological weapons are released on China. He heard this being discussed in this meeting. They will release a flu-like virus that will be genetically targeted against the Chinese population. It's racially targeted against the Chinese people. It's designed to spread like wildfire and to knock out a large number of the Chinese people. 
And these people in this meeting were laughing about this. They said, China will catch a cold. Those were their words. China will catch a cold. And they were laughing about the fact that these biological weapons will, will wreak havoc among the Chinese population. And after that, then what effectively will be a kind of plague will actually spread right across the world to the West as well. Now, so it was not clear whether this was a Chinese retaliation or whether the thing would just spread out of control in the way that it would be very understandable if it did, whether it's racially targeted or not, these things actually mutate. So now you've got a situation where there's been a limited nuclear war in the Middle East. There's a pandemic that really is sweeping across the world and really is getting... <laughs> I mean, crazy, right? Isn't that crazy? Now, well, let me finish the last few seconds people very visibly. And you've got this totalitarian military lockdown in all the governments in the Western worlds because everyone's going to be in panic about all of this. And then, he said, then the real war starts. Something that would be justifiably called the Third World War with a much more major nuclear exchange. There you go. We've revealed these things from scripture with the exception of the global pandemic that would come first and start as a cold as a flu-like virus in China. This video is from 2010, and the guy that was in the meeting was in 2005. First hand in the meeting, the guy who told him it. It literally happened, brothers and sisters. So what was their intent? Their intent was to have a short-term war in the Middle East, then release the flu-like virus on China that would turn into a global pandemic, killing people, and then World War III would begin. Now. Did we have a global pandemic start as a flu-like virus where China caught a cold and it spread to the West and caused totalitarian lockdowns? Hello? You see, I believe what's happened is they've been trying to get this going for a long time and they wanted to start with Iran and Israel and they weren't able to because that is going to be in the Lord God's timing. So by launching this attack the way they did with the pandemic, in launching this first, they were able to get all their ducks in a row, get people working in these centers, how to do all these things, and they pre-prepared everybody. Now, is it possible that after the attack on Israel and the Middle East war, is it possible that there is still another um another type of pandemic another thing being released well it's pretty interesting that there's been talk about it again isn't there there's been talk about new things coming out of china so is it possible there might be something else well let me show you something listen to this in leviticus chapter 26 we know that for their disobedience they're going to be removed from the land terror is going to come it's going to destroy them right seven times for the seven years right for seven years of seals they're going to be removed listen to what it says for yet seven times for your sins i will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant and when you are gathered together within your cities i will send the pestilence among you and you shall be delivered into the hand of your enemies interesting right you know why this is interesting because i had never seen it at that viewpoint until i was i was putting this together earlier today you know clearly the description that he gives here is all about what has already taken place but what we know comes next when the 50 days begins israel and iran we know it in fact, we're going to talk a little bit about it more or that connection based on what we're going to show with the birth of Christ. <clears throat> so we've known these things. So why did the Lord give it to confirm in this video? Because it was confirming everything I'd been teaching up to that point, but with exception to the pandemic that came first. We knew Israel was going to be attacked. It would be a short war. There would be a, a call for peace to rebuild. They would be destroyed again, this time Jerusalem, and the 14 years of tribulation would begin. The pandemic. Everything he described literally took place. Do you remember when Jodel gave me the word? 
She gave me the word at about 12, well, she gave it to me at 12.40 a.m. on March 11th. The video I did was on the evening of March 10th of 2020. Do you guys remember when the global pandemic was declared? You got it. It was declared on March 11th at about noon our time of 2020. This was the day I did the video, the evening that I prayed about it. That same evening, very late at night, early on the 11th, I received the wildest confirmation I've ever received about anything in my life, knowing that it was instructed by God the Father to give to the Spirit for me, which just blew my mind. She connected a video to it, which describes the beginning of tribulation as we have revealed it from his word, that the enemy has been working to play out, but we know will happen in God's time. And within it, a global pandemic that would start with a cold in China, spread to the word as, world as a global pandemic, with military lockdowns, people actually dying, and what happened? By noon, 12 hours or so later, the video that she included literally began to play out. You want to talk about the Lord God giving a confirmation? It doesn't get any wilder than that. It doesn't get any wilder. You see? What became the biggest part out of all of this? Yes, that video was, was seriously big, and that's why we still share it. In fact, I always keep a tab open for it. So if anybody comes to see my computer or something in the future, or I always want to make a little point on it, I could always just go to it. I always have it open because it's that important to me. And so the other piece that was even more important, though, is that the Holy Ghost told her right on target. So the, the phrase for me that was given to me to know and to understand these things <clears throat> was the phrase right on target. So why was right on target so important? Well, let's go have a look. When I saw the phrase right on target, I said, okay, I'm going to go do a Google search to see right on target. I mean, essentially, you know what right on target means. And I went and looked at pictures and look what it showed. All of the pictures were about a bullseye. Every single one was a bullseye. And what you guys didn't know is that I have a, a, a pool, a dartboard, I mean, leaning on a table and every once in a while, when I'd come and do a video or before I came and I was praying at night, I'd throw a few darts at it. And I was just, just for fun, I was just always horsing around and I was always trying to hit the bullseye. You know, that's what you do when there's a dartboard, right? You always want to try to hit the bullseye. And that's what I did. And then I see right on target. And I thought, well, I'm going to search to see what right on target means. Every right on target <coughs> was bullseye. So then I did a search for bullseye. And of course, every bullseye is like right on target so i'm looking through i'm looking through I'm, I'm seeing trying to see you know what can i understand from bullseye and right on target what does all this mean and i was scrolling through and scrolling through looking at these things i'm going to see if something shows up here and what happened was i saw something that really caught my attention i don't know if i'm going to see it here or not but it related ah there you go I saw one like this, and it was the head of the bull and the eye of the bull for bullseye. And I thought, huh. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And so I do a search in relation to this bullseye. And of course, when you do a search for bullseye, okay, bullseye, and you go look in the constellation, is there like a bullseye in the constellations? Of course, it's Taurus. And as I'm looking into Taurus, we find the head of Taurus. And in the head of Taurus, there's two eyes and, of course, Taurus. Well, do you realize that this eye, I mean, a lot of you guys that have been around for a while know it, but I want you to follow this story. There's a reason for it. There's a reason why I'm reiterating these things. So you can follow this clear path of revelation through Scripture and through receiving from the Lord. 
Right on target meant bullseye. There's an actual bullseye in the constellations of the Lord. And it's this eye right here on this side of Taurus. This eye is called Aldebaran, which was kind of freaky on its own because my name is called, people, my name is Alan Dubray, but people call me Al Dubray. So Al Dubray, Aldebaran. You know, it was kind of similar. So there seemed to be something interesting going on there. Well, as I continued looking into these things, right? Let me see what else I have with Taurus. I start looking into it, of course. I'm looking deeper into Taurus. And as you look into Taurus, you find out that Aldebaran is called the follower. Okay? Like the follower of Christ. When you dig a little bit farther, you find out that Aldebaran also means the eye of revelation. And I was like, what? Because of everything that's been happening, right? I've been receiving the revelation. And now the spirit gives me right on target. That means bullseye. <laughs> and I go to this eye and bullseye means what? The bullseye means 50. If you know darts and you throw darts, it means 50. It's the number 50. You get 50 points and it's worth 50. Well, if you recall, <coughs> 50 is what? 14. 14 equals 50. The video I had just done that the Holy Spirit confirmed was about 50 and the 14 years and then the 50th of Jubilee. It was about the letter noon being the eye of Taurus. Well, it was, didn't know about the eye of Taurus, but it was about the letter noon being the 14th letter and equaling 50, which brought about the revelation from Numbers chapter 13. It was the revelation of the end of days. And then <clears throat> I come to find out right on target is bullseye. And in heaven, there's an eye called the bullseye in Taurus. And when you look at the bullseye in Taurus, it's called Aldebaran. It's literally called the bull's eye. Okay. Aldebaran, the eye of the bull, the bull's eye. It means 50, and our brother, Ed, when he was doing digging into it, found out that what? It's the 14th brightest star in the sky. <clears throat> so the Spirit had led me to write on target with this one phrase. With this one phrase. Consider all of the revelation that has come from it. Our ministry, <coughs> excuse me is the ministry of the revelation of 14 years. It's the revelation of 50 that comes before the 14 years and at the end of the 14 years, the 50th Jubilee. This eye of Taurus is called Aldebaran. It's called the follower or the eye of revelation to the ministry who's been getting the revelation of the Lord. And all of this throughout this revelation of right on target, brought us to the creation, brought us to what in the beginning in the creation was, revealed to us Luke, Mark, Matthew as the spirit, the light, the flesh. It showed us that everything on, on, the, on the clock constellations, like the hands, like the, the numbers on a clock that never move. We came to find out that Taurus was the beginning in creation. And that the Father never moves. He never changes. Just like the constellations and the numbers on a clock. But the sun and the moon, the hours and the minutes do. <coughs> All of this revelation, and for three years since, has revealed to us Taurus, 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 nonstop, over and over and over and over again. Do you understand how crazy this is? The video was about 50 and 14. And the Holy Ghost points me to the eye of Aldebaran, the eye of Taurus called the bull's eye. 
and it represents noon, the 14th brightest star, which also means 50. What on earth are the chances of that? Having never had an experience like this, even in my life. Well, do you know it even gets crazier, right? Because you guys remember what happened next, right? We watched a video on the Shroud of Turin. In fact, it was shared with us after all of these things that were taking place. And we had all of this revelation happening in Taurus. We were shared this pendant that was found on the Shroud of Turin, which is the Shroud of, from Christ, which is what he was wrapped in. And guess what? With the technology, they were able to laser go in and read things all throughout the entirety of the Shroud of Turin. And they found that there was a pendant that Jesus had on his neck in the Shroud of Turin. Do you know what that pendant was? That pendant was this right here. It was these three Hebrew letters. Now we read from left to right, but the Hebrew read from right to left. So to us, it was noon, aleph, ayin. To the Lord, it would be ayin, aleph, noon. So guess what happened? We continued to do some digging into Taurus, right? <clears throat> we continued to dig into Taurus and what the head of Taurus represented. Guess what it represents? The pendant, for anybody new, it represents the pendant that Christ was wearing that's in the Shroud of Turin. Because this eye of Taurus is actually called the eye. That's it. It's called the eye. And in Hebrew, this eye, guess what? It's called ayin, ain or ayin. Do you know what ayin means? Ayin is the 16th Hebrew letter, and it means 70. So that means that the pendant the Lord was wearing was the head of Taurus. Aleph means Taurus. It means the head of Taurus. It means the beginning. It's Taurus in itself. The right eye to us, the one on the right, is Ayin. It's the 16th Hebrew letter, and it means 70. The one on the left, which is the one that the Holy Spirit gave us that was, it refers to ministry revealed. The bullseye right on target, the revelation, 1450, is what? It's actually noon. The name of that eye on the pendant of Christ is called noon, which means what? The 14th Hebrew letter, that means 50. <clears throat> 50. So that means this says 70, 1, and 50, or 14 years. But the number, so it'd be like 16, 1, and the, 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 the number of the Hebrew alphabet, 16, the number of the Hebrew alphabet, 1, and the number of the Hebrew alphabet, 14. But their actual numbers are 70, 1, 50. Do you know what they mean? 70 plus 1 plus 50 is 121. Check this out. 121 in the Greek means innocent. The innocent or what? Like an innocent or not guilty. Who was the only innocent man that we know? Christ Jesus, right? Do you know what the word 121 means in Hebrew? Man. The first man means Adam. Remember, it wasn't Adam that sinned. It was Eve, and then he didn't want to leave her behind. Who is Christ? The last Adam. Who does Adam represent? Not that Christ sinned, but what happened with Adam? He's the representation of the flesh. And then what happened thousands of years later? Christ comes in the flesh as the last Adam. The innocent man. That's Christ Jesus, isn't it? Do you remember what else it means, brothers and sisters? Do you remember what else this means? 
Do you know that the letter ayin, which means 70, aleph means one, nun means 50. So this is the head of Taurus right here. This is representing Taurus. This is the right eye. This is the left eye. The letter nun out of these three, the letter nun has another meaning. I told you I was going to get back. I was going to get to it uh, again later, right? The letter noon also has a final meaning. The letter noon, which means 50, which is a bent down, like praying, being on your knees, and the other one is standing upright, it means 700. So another way to count it, one equaled 121, the other way equaled what? 771. Ring a bell? <laughs> of course it rings a bell, doesn't it? Right? What is one, uh, what is 771? Or from right to left. So what would it mean? Watch this, watch this. So if you were to read it like the total equals 771, from right to left, it would be 177. Isn't that the revelation? 771? Isn't that the revelation of the end of days, 771? Right? Seven years, seven years, and one? 771? Hello? What about 177? Do you know why it's 177 going from right to left the way the Lord would be counting it? Of course you guys do. Because it's the revelation of the three feasts of the Lord that we've shared a number of times. <laughs> it's Passover. The Lord's Passover is seven days. The Feast of Booths is seven days. And the Feast of Weeks is the beginning. Seven years represented as seals, seven years represented as trumpets, and the Feast of Weeks, the beginning of it all. One, seven, 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 one, seven, one, seven. Why seven, one, seven? Because of the Feast of the Lord. Seven for Pas Passover week, one for Feast of Weeks, seven for Tabernacles. <coughs> We've revealed this, right? It's the entirety of the revelation of 717. And it's revealed in the pendant of the Lord. It's the eye, it's the head of Taurus. I want to beat on this. I want to make sure you guys get the importance of Taurus. Because if you believe one month off, and fine if you want to believe it, I'm not upset. I just want you guys to see and to understand. That if you believe in one month off on either side, then you can't believe all of this revelation that came from the Spirit for Taurus. Because Taurus would have no connection to its beginning. And I'm going to show you in these other revelations that are coming. Well, let me explain something else to you. Remember this with Daniel? <clears throat> Let's go back to Daniel chapter 9. The pendant actually proves out, how crazy is this? The pendant proves out Daniel chapter 9. 70 weeks, right? So at the Feast of Weeks, bam, the Lord begins the 50 days and everything starts. Okay? Feast of Weeks, bam, the 50 days begin the following day. What happens the following day? The 50 days begin, of which there's going to be destruction like we saw, like they've been planning for. And the Lord God's time is going to be at hand and it's going to be allowed. When those 50 days are over, we know then it'll be seven years of seals, which isn't to them. And then the seven years of trumpets, which are described next. So you have what? <laughs> this is so awesome. I finally found out the meaning, guys. This means 70, right? It's I, it means 70. This is Aleph, which means all of Taurus in general. It means one. And this is what? 50, which is noon. Right? 50 in the 14th year is going, 14 years. Guess what? What did Daniel 9 say? 70 years 
it ends. Then begins, which is Taurus, 50 days, which is noon. The revelation, brothers and sisters, of the pendant of Taurus that our Lord and Savior was wearing that is found on the Shroud of Turin is the 70 years ending at the Feast of Weeks like Daniel 9, then will begin in Taurus the 50 days and then the 14 years. We got it. I'd been trying to wonder when it was on the other side and how did it count and how would I, and then I just kind of set it aside. I'm like, we know that that's what it is. We've got the revelation, but I, how do we see it? How do we follow it in order? 70 ends, then begins in Taurus the 50 days. It's what we showed in the last video. It is the revelation of it all beginning at the Lord's quote unquote birthday, at the Father God's birthday, at the Father God's specific time, that's his. <clears throat> Why is it his? Because in the beginning, we have proven was Taurus. The Jews know it. That's why their alphabet begins with Aleph, which is the head of Taurus. That's why noon in the middle, rep I mean, that's why Aleph in the middle represents Taurus and the head of Taurus and the numbers on each side, the names on each side represent each eye of Taurus. Think about that. Do you know or have you ever heard in your life any definition of the pendant that Christ was wearing in the Shroud of Turin? Have you seen any writings, any studies about the pendant from the Shroud of Turin? Oh, we got the one from Nelson, right? Nelson Walters. But not, not the revelation of it, just that this is what it was. I have a suspicion that the revelation of this pendant was for us. But do you know why we couldn't get it earlier? Because we didn't have the confirmation from the Spirit that told us right on target. Because right on target is what led us to bull's eye. Bull's eye was the revelation of the eye of Taurus of this one right here that's actually called noon. That is the 14th brightest and equals the number 50 from the name noon, and it's called Aldebaran. Do you think that, that I should just dismiss these things? You got to be off your rocker. This is the revelation of the pendant that the Lord was wearing. Seventy years will end at the Father's quote-unquote birthday at his, the beginning in Aleph Taurus, and it will begin the 50 days. <clears throat> That's the revelation, guys. Do you remember that we shared that this gap theory creation Yes, it represents the first quote unquote 7,000 years, but he was so excited to create that it flew by like days. And it's, it's also a typology of the 50 days that come first. How did the 50 days start? In the beginning, which was Taurus. Do you realize, as we've shared, not only was it Taurus, which was the beginning of the year back then, <clears throat> but Christ is what? The first fruits of the feast of first fruits. This is the feast of first fruits. Which means in Taurus, in the beginning, it was the 16th day of the first month. It was the 16th day of the first month in the beginning of creation in Taurus. Isn't that crazy? That's pretty wild, isn't it? Because what happened when Christ came? When he died and he was in the grave, there was no real story of Christ yet. Because without his resurrection, 
there would have been no Christ. We needed his beginning. We needed the resurrection. Because the resurrection was a beginning, right? Well, guess what? This is one of the reasons why we were looking for the 50 days before. Until we realized more insight, right? Jesus is the beginning. He is the first of the first fruits, right? You guys remember that. Exodus 34, 26. Jesus is called the first. You see that? He is the first, the beginning. He is the first fruits of the feast of first fruits. This word is the feast of first fruits of the feast of first fruits. The feast of first fruits is resurrection day. It's resurrection day. It's the 16th. It was early in the morning on the 16th. Without that day, there would be no Christ. There would be no now. That day, in the beginning of creation, of the Feast of First Fruits, was in Taurus. When Christ came, the sun was already one month off now. And so when Christ came, it was in Aries. Now we're two months off. And so we're in Pisces. But guess what? So what does that first of all show? You're going to see when I show the death and resurrection and the birth of Christ, you're going to absolutely know it's impossible for us to be one more month off. It's impossible because the constellations never fluctuate. They never change. I'm going to prove the birth of Christ and his death and resurrection are the first and third month. I'm going to prove it. So if they were the first and the third month in his day and everything was off by a month, and yet in creation, Taurus, which was the beginning, was resurrection day, the 16th day of the first month. When he came, what happened? Everything was off by a month. Which means his birth to be on the third month, 15th day of the third month, means that everything was still off by a month. Which means there had to be two months and that day to the 16th between his death and resurrection from his birth. Just so happens there is. And now we know that we're precisely two months off because of the sun. So if we're two months off because of the sun, <clears throat> then that means Nissan is precisely where it's supposed to be. And it means Sivan is precisely where it's supposed to be. You see, in creation, this was month one. At the time of Christ, this was month one. In our time, this is month one. And it's all because of the movement of the sun having gone off course. It's impossible to be one month off. Literally impossible. Because this is Pisces, this is Aries, this is Taurus, and so on and so on and so forth. So, if Christ is the first of the first fruits, you see, who are the co-heirs with Christ? The sons of God, right? Romans 8, the sons of God, those who have the spirit of God, they're the co-heirs with Christ. They're the Genesis 1-1 uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. That gap creation, that's them. And what does Jesus say? He's the first of them. He's the beginning. He is the first of them. That's why he was the first of the first fruits. 
So all you got to do is say, okay, where are the other first fruits in the feasts of the Lord? You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just got to be able to read. Look at what it says. Feast of first fruits. This first fruits, as we've shared, there it is. 7225. It's the one without leaven when the sheaf of the wave offering happens at first fruits. So if Christ is the first fruits and this is the one, 7225 at the beginning, where else do we find? first fruits in all of these feasts where else do we find a first fruits only one other place the feast of weeks seven sabbaths from the day that you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering sorry from the morrow after the sabbath from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering seven sabbaths shall be complete Unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. Okay? The day after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. This is the count to Pentecost that begins the day after the seventh Sabbath. And when you begin, this is what it's saying. This is why you have the semicolon. When you begin to count those 50 days. There's two tenth deals of loaves, right? They're baked with leaven because we're the ones with sin. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Do you know this is the only other first fruits in the feasts? Which first fruits is this? 1061. Christ said that he was the feast of first fruits, but the first fruits of the first fruits. Pretty wild, right? Well, guess what? Christ said that he was the first of the first fruits. In the creation, it was Taurus, 16th day. Taurus, 16th day in our generation, the Lord knowing all things in advance, is what? There's the 15th day of the third month. There's the 16th day of the third month. What were we saying this could be? This could be the seventh Sabbath, which would make this the feast of weeks, right? The, the beginning of the 50 days, the time of the escape. And what would it be? The 16th day in Taurus. Isn't that exactly what creation was? The 16th day in Taurus? Hello. Where did the 50 days would end? They would end down here. 24th of July on the 6th of Av, right before the attacks begin on Jerusalem because the word told us that they only observed the fifth and the seventh months fasting and mourning for 70 years, which means they won't be able to do it in the 71st year. How crazy is that, right? You realize this all comes from Taurus too, correct? <laughs> I just want to make sure you're getting that. All of this comes from Taurus. All of it is Taurus. But let's carry on. Let's, let's see what else we can bring to the table to prove these things out, okay? Let me show you Romans chapter 8, which we know here very well as well, right? There is no, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's the spirit group. That's the 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. Those that go to paradise, those who are in Christ. Who are they described as? <clears throat> who are they described as? Watch this. They're described as those that are 
led by the Spirit of God. Well, you guys remember that teaching, right? Who are those that are led by the Spirit of God, but those are who are from the portion of the Spirit of God? The Spirit portion, the gap theory, the first two verses in the entire Bible. The Spirit of God are those who are in Christ, the Spirit group. And what does it say about them? <clears throat> For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of, of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and listen to that, joint heirs with Christ. Do you know why we're called you know why Jesus was called the first of the first fruits? Because we're his co-heirs, but he's the main, he's the main guy. He's the firstborn. He's the main one. We are joint or co-heirs with Christ. <clears throat> why? Because we're the first fruits. We're not the pure first fruits that he is. We are the eleven first fruits of the rest of the first fruits. If so be that we suffer with them, that we may be also glorified together. Listen to this. Verse 23. And not only they, but yourselves, but ourselves also, listen to this, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to which the redemption of our body. Those who are in Christ, spirit-filled with the Spirit of God, are co-heirs with Christ. They are the others of the first fruits of which Christ was the first. We cannot be the ones without leaven. We are the ones that had the lemon, the, the lemon, the leaven that he washed away for us. It's so awesome. Man, I love these teachings. I was so, I've been, I've been dealing and putting this together for the last few days since the last video because I started getting connections right away. <laughs> it was so exciting. So I've been itching to do this one. Well, let me share this with you guys, too, to now prove out this timing. This is from uh, our Have brother as well. A powerful method to achieve almost 2020 vision without. OK. This is uh, like I showed from this picture here, right? This is from that same video. But I want to show you guys this clip. Because this clip is very important for you guys to see the timing that we're talking about here again. Listen to this. Later, some experts have attempted to identify the coins on Jesus's eyes. And the best guess seems to be that they are the widow's mite, made famous in Luke 21. On the disc covering the right eye apparently is a litus, a curved arguable staff used in the Roman religion. And on the disc over his left eye, we find a sacrificial cup. So it appears two different coins were used. Besides these images, Researchers have managed to read the letters Y-K-I in the coins. This is thought to be the visible part of the word Tiberioi Kaikavok, Greek for Tiberius Caesar, that is, Emperor Tiberius, a numismatist. And Justino Stephazara dates them to the time of Pontius Pilate, and specifically to the year 29 AD. That was... There you go. <laughs> specifically to the year of 29 AD. Now check this out. I've shared on this in the past. I want to put these together so you guys can understand all of this is connected to Taurus. The third month, 15th day, or the time of the birth of Christ. You'll see what I'm getting at. So listen to this. This is from the Shroud, okay? Shroud.com. This was the guy that was there. This is the guy that discovered the meanings and what was printed on the coins. Listen to what he said. I was privileged to first correct to to a first correctly dated that coin by identifying the Greek letters on the back, indicating that it was struck in the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar or 29 A.D. 
This is pretty awesome. We've shared on this in the past, but it kind of started getting mixed up, right? Because things were, were seem stretched, because like, how could it be if we're still in this, right? It can't go much further. It's impossible. So listen to this. I've redone this, so you guys, if you wanted a copy, just let me know. I've color-coded it, you see. 50th Jubilee, end of the 70th, but this is the 70th of Jerusalem. Okay, you can see Feast of Weeks, Feast of Weeks, the beginning of the 14 years in blue to the beginning of the 14 years. It's at true Pentecost. The 70 years are done at the escape at the Feast of Weeks in red. <coughs> and what had happened is this is, what it, for those that don't know that are newer, I understood that there was 14 years left. We understood the big picture was 21, meaning seven, seven, and seven. So I had the idea a few years ago to go back and say, well, knowing this, let's just count back how many Shemitah cycles there were all the way back to Christ's birth. <clears throat> and when I did, it brought me to the second month, uh, sorry, it brought me to 289 Sabbath years since Christ, and I'm going to show it to you briefly, which, of course, for those that don't know, brought us to the revelation of Luke chapter 13, because I remembered this number that 289 is used one time in the New Testament, and the Greek 289 being used one time is in the story of the barren fig tree in the vineyard that says what? Three years I am come, I found nothing, cut it down. The vineyard answers and says, give it one more year. So a total of four years. And if not, after I dung it about, then you can cut it down. From this <clears throat> was the connection to saying, oh my goodness. Israel came into the land, right? But it wasn't until 49, 70 years plus four. You see, but we didn't fully, we didn't do the 49 right away. We were looking at last year, right? <clears throat> and this gave us the connection to plus four years, which then our brothers shared with us that led us to Leviticus 19 that showed the count from the beginning of the 70 years, which was you had to do these things when you came into the land. And then three years, you can't touch it. The fourth one to the Lord, just like this, the fourth one. And then after the fourth one, in that fifth year forward, it's yours. Which means from the fifth year forward, from 1953, it began to be theirs. So we know that the Lord God is counting from Feast of Weeks. And so from 1953, at the Feast of Weeks, the Lord God began the 70 year count. And when we go to Daniel 9, you see it all wraps together. We go to Daniel 9 and what do we see? 70 Feasts of Weeks are determined upon thy people. And what did it bring us back to? The video that the Holy Spirit had me keep by confirming to me what was in it was the revelation that the Lord God was counting from the Feast of Weeks and that the truth was 50 days, 14 years, and the 50th Jubilee. So now, <clears throat> excuse me, as we go back and we do this count and we see all the way back to the birth of Christ, okay, we now know <clears throat> we're looking from the Feast of Weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm going to show you why in a moment. We've got the count of Christ, but what are we looking at right now? We'll get back to that in a moment. We just saw that it said that the, that the coins that were found were from 29 AD in the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar. This is of massive, massive importance to us because if we go to Luke chapter 3, <coughs> excuse me, we see that it was in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, and listen to what it says. In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, in Luke, 13, in Luke 3, 3 uh, 23, 
it says, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Well, guess what? Here is 28 AD at the Feast of Weeks, okay? Up the dark, black, black. This is the end at the Feast of Weeks. So this is the start at the same place. This is the start of the Feast of Weeks, 28 AD. When what? When Jesus began to be 30 years of age in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. If the coin of Tiberius Caesar <coughs> was in the was minted in the year 29 AD and it was called the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar, then the 28th year would have been the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, exactly as Luke 3 told us, and Jesus began to be about 30 years of age. Do you know that this count is the Sabbath year's count all the way back up to the beginning? This explains all the, the three years and the fourth year and then the fifth year to theirs. We're going to now go delve into this and see the truth of when Christ was born. Jesus was born <clears throat> in the third month, 15th day. And you know what's crazy about this? I've shared on this. I've talked about it. I've revealed this, or I shouldn't say revealed, but shared on it from four or five years ago. Remember, I said I, I was going back and forth. Was Christ born at Christmas or was it Feast of Weeks or John or Jesus? And I had shared a video, as I said earlier, from a lawyer that has a, a video teaching that's been going around for, I think, decades now about the star of Bethlehem. And he said the exact same thing, excuse me, that this guy I'm about to share with you also says. And in this video, this guy, he was an atheist. And this video is, uh, well, it's only a couple of weeks ago. It was shared in the forum by Ivan. But this guy started off as an atheist. And so was his boss. Okay? So we're going to listen to a, a few minutes here and then a, a minute or so at the end. And listen to what he says. <laughs> we have one that's proved it, that's been traveling around for years. Then we had an atheist and his atheist boss put it together in a planetarium in a study. So he's looking from outside eyes and he became a Christian because of what was revealed in the stars. Listen to this. In my former life, I worked in a once great museum under a giant white dome. The museum had a fully digital planetarium that was state of the art then, and I was the manager of that technological marvel. It was my job to run all the daily shows and give lectures on astronomical topics. The museum was staffed largely by secular folks. Both myself and the director of the planetarium were atheists. We were both very well versed in astronomical and astrophysical sciences, and we both looked scornfully at faith-based interpretations of scientific subjects. Nearing Christmas in 2010, I was asked by the director of the planetarium if I would be willing to create a show about the star of Bethlehem. For me, I was more intrigued by the challenge of making and presenting the show than I was by the content itself. I accepted the director's request and started my research on the star and what it logically could have been. The first challenge I faced nearly broke the show. In my research, I had learned about a series of interesting conjunctions between planets and stars that occurred between 7 and 2 BC. When I entered the dates of the events, the sky in my planetarium revealed nothing unusual or interesting. Every date I entered revealed the same uninteresting arrangement of celestial bodies. Then I realized that the Gregorian calendar does not acknowledge a year zero, but astronomical calculations of time do. So when adjustments were made, the Beth... So that means 2 BC on the Gregorian, but on like um, a, 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 a Stellarium, there would be 1 BC. So when you look at it on Stellarium, <coughs> which you see on his, on his video, it shows 1 BC. So if we were to go to Stellarium and look at it, I forgot to bring it up. Um, Stellarium will show 1 BC, but on the Gregorian, it would be 2 BC. Fascinating conjunctions that I failed to see before finally showed up. Impressively, too, once you understand how rare they are. Realizing that there really was an incredible confluence of astronomical events occurring in the skies between 7 and 2 BC, I sought a deeper understanding of those who witnessed the events and what they meant to them. What I discovered was a fascinating convergence of astronomy, history, and biblical prophecy that made not only a fascinating show, 
but offered a curiously accurate explanation for something that was considered an unprovable myth by the public. To make the show, my goal was to forensically gather relevant data and provide the most probable explanation of what happened in the sky and how it was interpreted by the educated contemporaries of the day. This meant that I was going to exclude the usual explanations or the parade of unlikely celestial suspects that are offered in traditional planetarium shows about the Star of Bethlehem, for instance, exploding stars, comets, or other unrelated astronomical phenomena. The show that was created ended up becoming wildly successful. The accurate portrayal of the astronomical data built upon a historical understanding of the ancient people making the observations allowed me to walk a very thin line between science and faith. The faith-based audiences that filled the sold-out shows year after year had no idea that the guy giving the show, the guy they were giving a standing ovation to, was an atheist. Interestingly, secular planetariums are where most people of faith get their understanding of the Star of Bethlehem. Now that's because the planetarium's nature and purpose is to accurately show the sky and any of the objects seen in it at any given time in recent history. And 15 years ago, the planetarium was the only place you could see it. It is no wonder then that most people do not have a clear understanding of what happened 2,000 years ago in the skies above ancient Babylon. Today, with modern software that is freely available, anyone can replicate an accurate view of the sky from the Earth throughout human history from their own computer, sans the immersive experience that a planetarium can provide. To comprehend the significance of celestial events on the minds of the ancient observers requires us to unknow things we know as truth today. For instance, today we know Jupiter is a gas giant planet, the largest planet in the solar system, or that Saturn is a ring world. The astrologers of the ancient world, who had no telescopes at their disposal, could only have known that the sky was full of stars, and that the brightest of these stars moved across the sky back and forth in a seemingly unpredictable way. Those moving or wandering bright stars were called planetes, or wanderers in Greek. Those celestial wanderers traversed the sky like the arms of a clock, passing by 12 familiar constellations instead of the 12 numerals on the face of a clock. Their unique quality of motion and the places where they passed earned them names that would become associated with gods, kings, empires, and the fate of humankind. You see that? First of all, I wanted to give you just a background. This guy did this for a living. He was an atheist. His boss was an atheist. He went and did all the study, all the research, the ancient scriptures, did all sorts of things to discover it and put it all together, an incredible show in this planetarium to reveal this star phenomena that took place. Okay? It's really, really awesome. And this, of course, this is just like a 16-minute video about sharing about what he did. Now listen to what he shares here, and then I'm going to show you why this is important to us now. To punctuate this announcement in a truly spectacular way, after the third conjunction of Planet of Kings and Regulus, Venus appears to rise out of the western sky at sunset in the early evening sky of June 17th, 2 BC. The Planet of Kings and the Planet of Love and Fertility meet in a second and even more spectacular conjunction that creates for one brief night the brightest object seen in the sky outside of the sun or the moon. This dazzlingly bright object is seen in the Lion of Judah, affirming for the Magi that the King of the Jews is born. This astonishing object is a momentary star that spoke to the Magi and revealed... There you go. And revealed that a king was born. The conjunction of the Star of Bethlehem was June 17th, 2 B.C. Watch this. From 2 B.C., at the Feast of Weeks, at approximately the Feast of Weeks, you do the count, so here's what it is. Okay, we're going from about Feast of Weeks to Feast of Weeks. Jesus' birth, the end of the first year, there's your Feast of Weeks, he turns one, okay? So the numbers that are here are the beginning of the years, are on the left side, okay? So when he completes, there's the beginning, okay? Now he's one. When he completes that year, now he turns two. So when this year starts in year zero, he's now two years old and he's going through that second year and so on and so forth. When you follow it all the way through, you get precisely the 28th year, which is the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar when those coins were, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the year before those coins were made, in the 28th year, which is the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, when Jesus began to be 30, and the evidence is the coins that were minted in 29 AD, which is called the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar. And what have we proven by this? What do we know? Jesus fulfills one whole year, right? Two, three, four, and part of, a, of the fifth year. Remember, the whole world 
only goes from the simpleton view that the church told them. He was born in zero. He died in 33 AD. So he was 33 years old at his death. No, he wasn't. He wasn't born at year zero. He wasn't 33 years old at his death and resurrection. He was 34, approaching 35, but he was still 34 years old. And it was the revelation of the end of days that revealed this to us. Because John was still around for two months while Jesus was baptizing with his apostles, and so was John with his. Jesus, uh, John was then taken to prison, for which he was in prison about 10 months before he was beheaded. Which means there was an entire year, an entire year, from when Jesus began to be about 30 years of age till he was 30 years, 31 years old. John was still around. While John was in prison, people were still following John. They were still outside the gates and, and screaming out for him until John was no more. Then everybody turned now to Christ. The first year was Jesus growing with his disciples and the apostles. It was, it was like the, the setup because John was still on the scene. This became revealed to us through the revelation of the end of days. <clears throat> because what happens? At the end of the first six years of seals, the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion, Ezekiel 39 war, the 144,000 are sealed, the rapture of the great multitude in, in about the middle-ish time of the, seven, of the seventh year. Then there's the, the peace the, uh, uh, that he makes with all nations in the seventh seal. It didn't even start trumpets yet. It's, it's three and a half years and the rebuilding hasn't even begun. So we know that it was approximately four and a half years. It was one year of everything getting set up because John was still on the scene. And then it was one more year, two, three, and a chunk of the fourth. And you see, I have this highlighted red here just to show that it wasn't the end of the year but it was the time of Passover. It wasn't all the way to the Feast of Weeks at his birth, okay? It was at Passover, and we were saying, remember, Feast of Weeks to Feast of Weeks, okay? Or the 15th day of the third month to the 15th day of the third month, year after year after year, okay? It's right here. There's the evidence. Right to his birth, the Star of Bethlehem, the number of Sabbaths, the whole nine yards. Everything is there and the continued Sabbath count that went all the way up, including the count of the four years, then the fifth year is theirs, brings us all the way to 70 years from the Feast of Weeks, or the third month, 15th day of 2022 to 2023, the Father's birthday. Okay, so we know, and this isn't the first video, but now knowing, that it was the third month, 15th day. And you say, what do you mean third month, 15th day? It was June 17th. Oh, pretty crazy, right? June 17th. That guy's video, right, about, about China catching a cold was June 18th. My first videos I did, guess what? It was June 16th and 17th. It was in two parts. That little girl was June 6th. June, 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 June. My first video was posted in two parts, the 16th and 17th. The Eye of Taurus, Aldebaran, 5014, noon. Come on. <laughs> so check this out. Some people would debate, oh, no, because Herod died in 4 BC. No, there's Herod and there was Herod the Great. When you go and study and you seek these things out, this Herod actually died probably around 1 BC. There's studies on this everywhere. People have debated this for a long time, but the church, if you're learning from the church, you're just learning things that they thought they understood years ago and they will not change. They cannot change. Their boards will not allow them. The entire congregation and, and, the, and, the, and the seminaries behind them will not allow them to. It's too much. They don't want to cause confusion, they'd say. 
they go to try and teach things like this, they would be kicked out of the pulpit. So instead, they say, oh, okay, I'll keep doing what I do. I'll stick with the status quo. And you know what's going to happen to them? This was shared in a video. I can't remember the brother's name, the pastor's name. But you see, you know what's going to happen to them? This right here. Do you know what Ezekiel 34 is? Check this out. Do you know in our chapters to years, Ezekiel 34, see Ezekiel lines up, look at that. Right at the beginning of the 14 years. 33 is, is the son of man coming for his 40 days. And there's the beginning of the 14 years. And how does it start? Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves and feed uh, 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 should not the shepherds feed the flock? You see, what's going to happen? And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. These are the pastors. These are those in the pulpits, the pastors, the teachers, the, the proclaimed prophets, everything else. Does it mean everybody and everybody's bad and everybody's wrong? No. I believe it's probably like 90-10, as you guys know. 90% of the church is going to be left behind because 90% of the church doesn't understand prophecy, doesn't bother to look at it, says, hey, I can't know it, so I'm not going to go into it. So what does that mean? You can't be prepared. How on earth can you be prepared if you're not spending any time seeking the Lord? They claim a third of the Bible is prophecy. Yet a third of the Bible they won't teach on. We know it's way beyond. The revelation has proved it's like almost the whole Bible is prophecy. Two thirds at least, maybe even 80, 90% is filled with prophecy. But it was never understood to be prophetic. So they've only claimed only 30%. So they're missing out on preparing their flock. And they're about to pay for it. And the flock is going to be scattered. And he will send his shepherds in to the mix. Those who he opens their understanding to. Those who will receive then the anointing of the Holy Ghost and no one will need to teach them. That's what's coming. That's why these Terry Bennett's and these, I mean, man, I just think that's so dangerous. I mean, I would think you had better be the most sure person on earth before you ever claim something like that. That the Lord has taken you, that you've done this, that you've done that. Do you understand, guys, that how could it be? Is somebody that big of a liar? Is that conniving? Is it really possible? Is he maybe not a brother? And these guys can really be that conniving? Because stories of having gone to heaven, being with the Lord and the Lord teaching them and explaining these things, being in heaven like hundreds of times or dozens of times, the Lord visiting and explaining these things to you, and they're all wrong. The entirety of the revelation claimed to have been given by the Lord is wrong. Man, that's brutal. I am so grateful, as I know many of you are, that we have the revelation by His Word. His Word. That's way better, in my opinion, because how else can these other people prove without it, without the Word? So much easier to have the word as long as you've been given revelation, right? <laughs> I mean, we've been given the discernment. We've been given his revelation. That's what the eye of Aldebaran is. So now remember, what about this June 17th of 2 BC? <clears throat> well, let's go have a look. You see, that's the Hebrew year 1 BC because the Roman year is 2 BC. What happens when you go to June 17th of 2 BC? Guess where you end up? Savan, third month, 15th day. You see? 17th, 
the 15th. There's your row, okay? There's your row. You follow it through. You follow it through. There's one. Okay, this is on the Hebrew calendar side, Gregorian calendar, Hebrew calendar. This is, this is a, a, a program designed to do all the accounting for you. Okay, it's already done. 17th day of June of 2 BC is the third month, 15th day. Third month, 15th day. Do you remember the pendant? Ayin is the 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Do you know that noon is the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet? And Aleph, who is Aleph? Christ is Aleph, right? <clears throat> Christ is Aleph. He is the beginning and the end. He is the beginning, the Aleph. Taurus, one, beginning. When was the beginning for Christ in the flesh? Savan 15. Savan 15, right? So the Aleph, the beginning, when he was made flesh, was born on the 15th. Taurus is what? 16, 14, and in the middle is the Aleph, the beginning, Christ. And Christ was born on the 15th. What? 14th, 15th, 16th? Kind of sounds like the creation story, right? Kind of sounds like Passover is crucifixion in the tomb and resurrection. That's when you go from left to right. From right to left, it's the end of it, right? 70 ends, then begins on the 16th, the 50 days. Craziness. Craziness. 15th of Savan. Now, let me show you a calendar. Where did I put that calendar? Oh, down here. Let me give you a picture. Oh, it's not there. Where did I put that? Just give me one moment. Right here. Okay. Let me show you in a calendar what is going on. <clears throat> I know I got it around here somewhere. Just bear with me for a moment. I thought I did. Shoot. Okay, let me see if I click on this. I just want you guys to see something. That's not very bright. Oh, come on, dude. I just want to give you guys a, a, a simple view. Okay, let me do it like this. Just so you can see this for 2023. <clears throat> okay? So what had happened is we saw Christ when he was born. Okay? And Christ was born on June 17th, okay? And June 17th of 2023 is the 4th of June. So it was June 17th equaled on the Hebrew calendar the third month, 15th day. Well, the third month, 15th day in Jesus's time, it wasn't Taurus, right? It was the one more month that was Gemini because everything was still off by one month from creation. So the third month, 15th day, Jesus was born in Gemini. So when you go look it up in Stellarium and you go back to 33 AD and you look up when Christ's uh, death and resurrection at, th at April 3rd of true 33 AD. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm talking about his birth. When you go to 2 BC, that 1 BC on Stellarium, <clears throat> and you look up his birth, Jesus was born on the third month, as, it's, as it showed, on the third month, 15th day, which is Savan 15. In that year, Nisan was in 
what? In Aries. It was Aries, Iyar was Taurus, and Savan was, what is it, Gemini. So Jesus was born on the third month, 15th day. In 33 AD, at his death and resurrection, Nisan and the 14th day of Nisan was in Aries. How many months between them? Well, essentially exactly two months, but it's the middle of the first month to the middle of the third month. Nisan was in Aries. Sivan was in Gemini. In the creation, Nisan was Taurus. Okay? So in the creation, Nisan, the first month, was Taurus. And in the creation, it was the 16th day in the first month. Because in the beginning, it was Taurus. When Christ came, Nisan is where Iyar is now. Nisan was in Aries. So we're going to look at this. This was in the creation of in the beginning. It was Taurus, and Christ began the creation on Resurrection Day, the 16th day of the first month. When Christ showed up, the sun was off already by one month. And it meant that now Aries became the first month. Okay? At Aries, in Jesus' time, at his death and resurrection, which was at the 14th through the 15th and 16th resurrection in Aries was in 2 BC, was in Aries where the year began. Okay? And he was born what? He was born in the third month from Aries, <coughs> which is Gemini. First month to third month birth to death, death and resurrection. Then what happened? Then we follow it through to where we are now. And what happens? Now the third month, I'm not saying Savan, I don't, I'm trying to do it in a way not to confuse you guys. In the third month, which is where we are now, what happened? Now, it's not Taurus the first month. It's not Aries the first month. Right? We're now in Pisces as the first month. Because in our days, 2,000 years later, the sun has gone off by one more month. So what happens? That would mean if you go to the calendar... <clears throat> Nisan has to be the first month, and it needs to be in Pisces. Guess what? It is. That would mean the third month, Sivan, must be in Taurus. Guess what? It is. At creation, Taurus Sivan was month one. At the time of Christ, Iyar Aries was month one. And in our day and age, Nisan, Pisces, is month one. So when Christ was here, he was born in, well, now it's just, it's confusing because of where the months are now, right? But remember, Ayar was the beginning of the year. Jesus was crucified and his death and resurrection was in the month of Ayar. Well, you know what I mean, the first month, right? This Ayar was Aries the first month. He was born in the third month of Gemini. Sivan 15, just like it said. 
Sivan 15 was when Jesus was born. In his day, Nisan was Aries and Sivan was Gemini. In our day and age, it's moved by two months, which means there's absolutely no possibility whatsoever at all, nada, to be one month off. Because Nisan, and where it is right now, is in Pisces. Aries is no longer the first month of the year because we're off by two months from creation, which is one month off from when Christ was here. You see? In the beginning, at Christ, and today. So what's the equivalent to today? The creation, in the beginning, both were in Taurus. 16th day of the first month. But now there's two months separating them. And the 15th day of the third month is here in Taurus. So Taurus has never gone away. It's still the Lord God's time in Taurus. The, the clock hands have never shifted. But the sun has gone off course. So do you understand? I really want to hammer this home that Christ was born in the third month, 15th day. His death and resurrection were in the first month, 15th, uh, 16th day. First month, third month. Even though everything was off by a month, which means if everything is off by two months, then this is the first month, and this is the third month. And there's an extra point to why I'm saying this. Because it means that we can't go and say, like I was thinking maybe last year, we can't say that I wonder if maybe God is going to count Savan as he did in the beginning, okay? And maybe Savan 16 is actually resurrection day, right? Like at the beginning, the beginning of creation on the 16th day. And he's gonna do his Passover week, and then he's gonna count seven Sabbaths, and then it takes us to the end of Shavuot right here. No, you know why? Because when Christ came, his death and resurrection was at the one month off in Aries. And his birth was in the third month on the one month off in Gemini on the third month, 15th day. Which means if we are now two months off with the sun, which is scientifically absolutely proven, we know it, then that means Nisan is where it should be this is the resurrection day, and this is the third month, 15th day. Not maybe, not kind of, no way around it. It's absolute, it's 100% true. So now the question in all of this is, have you guys ever seen this video? I'm going to just play a few seconds of this. Listen to this. It's about the birth of Christ. Guang Wu of the Han Dynasty was given signs of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Not only was he given signs, he was able to interpret them correctly as signifying the salvation of all mankind. This is absolutely incredible stuff, and I cannot wait to share it with you all today. But first, a shout out to Stephen Welp, a member of our community, for helping us research this topic. Now, Emperor Guang Wu was a well-known historical figure. He served as Emperor of the Han Dynasty, restoring it in AD 25, thus founding what historians now call the Later Han Dynasty. He ruled over parts of China at first, but the whole of China was consolidated by him by the time of his death in AD 57. That kind of puts him in a league with other monarchs of his time who ruled vast empires, you know, guys like Augustus Caesar, whom you have heard of. He was a big deal. Guang Wu isn't a minor king. But what makes him interesting to us today is that he observed astronomical signs of the death and resurrection of Jesus and properly interpreted these signs. Luckily, Guang Wu dated the entries of his chronicles. The first one was dated from the seventh year of his reign. As we saw earlier, he first took power in AD 25. That plus seven years makes the seventh year of AD 32, right? Well, no. 
Like many emperors, they counted the year of their reigns from the first complete year. So the seventh year of his reign would actually be AD 33. This is important. Wait till you see why. The entry was also made in April of that year, April 33 AD. It reads, quote, Yin and Yang have mistakenly switched, and the sun and moon were eclipsed. The sins of all the people are now on one man. Pardon is proclaimed to all under heaven. End of quote. This comes from the history of the later Han Dynasty, Volume 1, Chronicles of Emperor Wang Wu, 7th year. Pretty crazy, right? I think many of you guys may have heard this before. <clears throat> this is a great quick little video about it. There's no way that this, that this emperor could have known, right? Which means the spirit had to reveal it to him. He wrote in his journal, in the, in the whatever text that they had, in April of 33 AD, that a man had come from heaven, taken on himself the sins of the world. There's no way he could have known that. And yet it was in his writings from over two, almost 2,000 years ago. That's pretty crazy, right? That's pretty crazy. Christ was indeed, his death and resurrection were absolutely in 33 AD. We can even prove all of these things now, guys. We did it through scripture and with others having shared the sun, moon, and stars. You see, on the backs of others, on the, the shoulders of others, right? We keep everybody else on the shoulders of the next. The, the coins, that helped us reveal it to us. People with historical records that have done the research, right? The sun, moon, and stars. Us having done the Sabbath year counts, bringing us to that four years, and then 70 is complete. Guys, it's all true. It's all true. Jesus was born on the 15th day of the third month. His death and resurrection was on the first month, 16th day. First month to third month. In his day, it was a month off. In our day, it's two months off. So the first month is Pisces and the third month is Taurus. Not maybe, not kind of. It absolutely is true. So now the question remains. When we count this from the Leviticus count, do we count from the first day of the week <clears throat> at Resurrection Day? Or do we count from today, the first day of the week, after the Sabbath from the week of unleavened bread? That becomes the question. Remember what I said earlier on in the last, uh, from the last video, that I had pretty much set this one aside and believed it was either going to be here or it was going to be connected to here because of the moon being off 10 days. But you know what I was just able to show you in all of this? That there was no need for the account of the moon. Do you realize that? The moon has already been accounted for. Because Christ was born on the third month, 15th day. And his sacrifice was in the first month, 14th day, death in the tomb, 15th, and resurrected on the 16th. And the count was a month off from creation and a month off from where we are now. The only way it could have been a month off first month and a month off third month from where we are now is if the sun was accounted for by the one month, which it was, and the moon was already in its correct place. You see, you can't have a Passover, you see, and then the beginning of unleavened bread begin at a full moon and say, oh, well, it's 10 days off. So really, in, in true history, it should be somewhere over here that it actually begins. How on earth could anybody know if there's never a full moon to account it by? Well, the evidence that you don't have to because it has been accounted for is the fact that Christ in the first month, 14th through the 16th day in Aries in 33 AD did in fact prove that it was Passover on the 14th, 15th was, was full moon at 
the beginning of unleavened bread, and his resurrection was on the morning of the 16th. The sun needed to be accounted for, but the moon not, because you need the moon. Otherwise, how would you know when Passover was or any of those feasts? You following what I'm saying? It's literally impossible to say that we're one month off knowing that the sun is precisely two months off, knowing that it was one month off at Christ and knowing that it was bang on in Taurus in creation. And it just so happens that all of those thousands of years later, that if this, whoops, that if the 15th day of the third month is the seventh Sabbath, then guess what? The 15th day of the sixth month is the beginning of the 50 days and what? The Feast of First Fruits. Remember, in the beginning of creation, <coughs> Taurus, Sivan, which is now the third month and not the first, it was the first month. And on the 16th day, on the Feast of First Fruits, the first of the first fruits began the creation. This typology is 50 days, remember guys? And if Christ is the first of the first fruits and it was in Taurus on the 16th day, which in the beginning reflected the first month, 16th day, as him being the first fruits unleavened, and he is of the first of the first fruits, then that would make this the seventh Sabbath and the beginning of the 50 days, just like the creation in Taurus on the 16th day. How about that? Well, guess what? There's still, it still goes a little bit deeper, right? Because this 15th day, this, this is the birth of Christ, the 15th day of the third month. It's the birth of Christ. And when we do the Sabbath counts, it's the birth of Christ as the seventh Sabbath if we count from the first day after the Sabbath of unleavened bread, okay, after unleavened, this, this is the seven days of unleavened bread, and this is the weekly Sabbath. So the morrow after it would be from today. Okay, there's the beginning now. So you would have what? One, two, because it goes according to the moons. I'm going to prove it to you. Two, three, four, five, six, seven which would make the 15th day of Sivan, the beginning of the 50 days, the date of the escape, feast of first fruits, directly connected to Taurus on the exact same day in the creation when the first fruits, who is part of the first fruits, created it all. And the entire picture of that is the beginning of 50 days. Come on. Remember this? As we start to wind this down, remember this with, um, with Exodus? We shared it a, a number of times lately, okay? 14th day, on the 15th day, they put the blood, and then what? On the 15th day, they fled. On the 15th day, they fled. So the 15th day of the first month in Moses' day, they fled. When they got to the wilderness of Sinai, it was the third month, same day as they left from Egypt. That means it was the 15th day of the third month in Moses' time. When they get there, the Lord tells them, as we know the story, right? Have them be ready the third day. We go to the other chapters. Then it talks about yet seven days. And then he went up for 40 days and 40 nights. There is our 50 to Pentecost. 
it seems highly probable and likely that this is the seventh Sabbath and this is the beginning of the 50 days. It seems less likely now that this count with the circuit of the sun is necessary. I know what it says in Psalms 19. Believe me, I've read it. But the evidence of the birth of Christ and his death and resurrection do not align with needing to add 10 days for the moon. Remember, I shared that even with um, the 14thers. The 14thers were proclaiming that the 14th day of Nisan, knowing when it was because of the moon, right? They knew when the crescent moon started on the, on the month when it was a beeb. They knew the 14th day, and then it would be the full moon. They knew the 14th day of the first month. They were willing to die for it in part. That was, there was many other reasons because of their faith, but in part, this was one of it. And they were mocked for being 14thers because they were sticking to true Passover. Would you put your life on the line if you didn't think that was true? Wouldn't you believe the, the apostle John who told you, who was with Christ? This is why they were so adamant on sticking with the 14th. Well, if they were sticking on the 14th of the true first month, why would they do that if, if the truth was that it was 10 days off and this is where they really should have been doing it? I mean, that alone is evidence that it's not true. That the moon has been accounted for on their calendars now. You see? We even know this and I've shared this a few times lately in the past, man, we shared it a lot. But in Zechariah chapter 7, when it says those 70 years past tense, in the fifth and seventh month, when you fasted and mourned those 70 years. That means for 70 years, they fasted on the ninth of Av and on the first or the third of, of Tishri. Why would it say that they did that in the prophetic for 70 years if they didn't do it on the fifth and seventh month for those 70 years? We know this is prophetic, right? This is Zechariah chapter 7. I mean, we know Zechariah 14 chapters, 14 years. This is more evidence that it's not off by a month because they did this in the fifth and the seventh month for these 70 years that we're still currently in which means they never got to do it in the 71st, 72nd, 73rd. So if this is the 70th, we cannot reach the 9th of Av. Hello. But it also means that their calendar is correct. Add that to the fact of Christ's death and resurrection and his birth. They're all about what? Christ was the first fruits in the beginning. At his death and resurrection, he was the first fruits in the beginning. Month one, 16th day. In creation, month one, 16th day. But month one, 16th day in creation was Taurus. But now because of the sun being off by two months, first month, 16th day, is in Taurus. First fruits of the first fruits. Hello. But guess what? There's still something else to kind of <clears throat> to pull out of all of this. Right? There's still something else to, to understand here. This is Jesus' birth. Dun dun dun. This is Jesus' birth. Don't we know a thing or two about Jesus' birth? <clears throat> we do, don't we? What if we go to Luke chapter 1? Remember we know Luke in order? You guys know this. Like We've beaten this up, right? We, we know it like crazy. Doesn't it start with the typology of John the Baptist's birth? 
And then what? The eighth day of his circumcision. And then you go to Luke chapter 2. And it's like the Lord, it's the typology of the escape. The seven to the eighth day, the Lord comes at the end of, the, uh, at the end of seven. And on the eighth day, he returns. And it's a typology of his birth. Remember Luke in order, pre-trib escape. Seven-day wedding returns on the 8th, Luke 2. It's the typology of the 40 days of Son of Man coming at his birth. Luke chapter 3 is like him coming at the end of seals on heavenly Mount Zion to fulfill that seventh year before the rebuilding starts in trumpets for about the first three and a half years. Luke 4 is after he's been cut off, he's gone, and then he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, tempted by Satan, then destroys him. That's Luke in order. Well, we have what? We have a typology with John's birth. The seventh to the eighth day, like the wedding in heaven. On the eighth day, we know the Lord returns, just like what happened from the story of John's resurrection. Then we go into Luke, the 40 days of the Son of Man at his birth, which is the typology of him being here as the Son of Man with Luke during, the 50, during 40 days of the 50 in Pentecost. When do the 40 days begin? The typology in Luke 2, in Luke in order, is from his birth. Well, guess what? Isn't there another place where we have this exact same revelation that we've spoken about many times lately? First attack in northern Israel, right? This is going to be that first attack with Iran and Israel. And then what happens? We know this happens at the beginning of 50 days after the escape. Then what happens? Jesus shows up. The Son of Man is coming for 40 days. When does he show up? That's right. After the wedding, after the seven days, he shows up on the eighth day as the Son of Man, connected to the time of his birth. Oh, look at that. For unto us a child is born. When does he do it? Not at the beginning of the 50. The light affliction is going to happen first, and then he's going to come as light shining in it. It's the same story of Luke in order. And then, of course, you know, when the 50 days, when, when his 40 are up, and then the 50th day is up, bam! Syria, who had surrounded them with their buddies, are going to destroy Jerusalem, and they're going to be removed from the land for seven years, just like Daniel said. But when does he show up? For unto us a child is born. It's a typology of him coming for his 40 days at his birth. Well, if this is his birth, is this going to be the beginning of the 50? Or is this the beginning of 40? Hello. Hello. Do you know why? Because. That count was counting the weeks like this, and this was the first Sabbath. There's your second Sabbath, and so on and so forth. That got us to the 15th. But we don't have anything connecting us to the 23rd of Nisan. Do you know that? Do you know that it tells us, and we've shared this in the past, but sometimes when you see other things happening, you kind of, you still bounce around a little bit. But when is the sheaf of the wave offering? When you come into the land which I shall give you and shall reap the harvest thereof, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and you shall wave the sheaf before the Lord your God to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. So the question that everybody debates, like we said in the last video, is it this Sabbath, there's the Sabbath, and there's the morrow after? Or is it this Sabbath, and this is the morrow after? Well, guess what? Wasn't in the beginning, the 16th day of the first month, when it was in Taurus? Wasn't the beginning of Christ and his resurrection and the beginning of the whole story being revealed as truth because of his resurrection begin at the 16th day of the first month, which would have been in Aries in his time? Don't you think it's possible that maybe if this is the sheaf of the wave offering, that this is when we begin to count, and that makes this the first Sabbath, 
The second Sabbath, remember the moon phases. The third Sabbath, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I miscounted. The first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and what did I miss? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, there we go. I was still bouncing over there. Six and seven. That, oh, that's why. 29th, and then it goes to the eighth again. So that would be the seventh Sabbath. So the eighth of Savan. So if we count from this, from the morrow after this Sabbath, well, this was Feast of First Fruits. This is the Feast of First Fruits. This was in the beginning. So if that's the Feast of First Fruits, and we count the seventh Sabbaths from that being the morrow after, then this would be the seventh Sabbath, and this would be the beginning of the 50-day count. Well, guess what happens? What is it? One, two, three, four, five. Wait. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's the eighth day. From the eighth to the ninth brings this to the eighth day. Is it possible? Considering this was the birth of the Son of Man, and the original birth was connected to this time, or the beginning, I should say, and this was his birth, is it possible that this is the seventh Sabbath and the beginning of the 50 days, which means there's your wedding week, right? Or, sorry, there's your wedding week to the Lord returning to begin his 40 days on the eighth day? Now, the question would be, well, wait a second. I thought the 16th of Savan was supposed to be the Feast of First Fruits, right? If in the beginning, the first of the first fruits, is this not it? Well, let me show you something as I start to close this out, or as I'm almost about to close this out. Remember Romans? And we showed in Romans 8, right? The first fruit, right? Those who are in Christ. Remember there's a remnant worker bride portion that are the first fruits who will remain to work with them? Remember what it said in verse 17? And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Do you remember who's going to rule and reign with them for a thousand years as joint heirs ruling and reigning as kings and priests? It's the Smyrna group, isn't it? It's those who are waiting for him, girded about, waiting for when he returns from the wedding. It's the Smyrna group. It's the Luke remnant bride workers. They are what? Joint heirs, co-heirs. What do you do as a co-heir? You rule and reign with them. Who's going to be ruling and reign? There's only one group that Scripture tells us will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. It's the Smyrna group, those remnant bride workers, first fruits workers who put their necks on the line. Yeah, that's right. You remember that? What does it say? If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. When is Christ going to be glorified? At the end? At the end of tribulation, when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, destroys the enemy, binds them, what does he do then? He's going to resurrect his joint heirs. Those who what? Those who went through tribulation and suffered with them as his workers. 
This is the Luke, uh, the Revelation 21 guys, right? Or uh, Revelation 20, right? Those who refused didn't take the mark, so on and so forth. And they were resurrected to rule and reign with them for a thousand years. It's the Smyrna group that we've shown a hundred times. It's the Luke group who those who uh, uh, some of you shall be put to death. Remember what else it said? They're what? They're the first fruits of the spirit, right? This is in Romans. Do you remember the revelation of the last chapter of Romans, last chapter, first Corinthians, last chapter, second Corinthians? It's all about the worker groups. It's about the pre, mid, and post in all three of the last chapters. And here we are in Romans, the first fruits of those who will suffer with Christ as co-heirs with Christ. And what does Romans 16 tell us about this first fruits groups worker? Romans 16, 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, see, in Christ Jesus, whom have for my life laid their own necks, have laid down their own necks. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Empetus, who is the first fruits of Achia unto Christ. These guys are the first fruits workers, Smyrna type putting their necks on the line for the houses, the churches of the Gentiles during the time of seals. They are the ones who will be resurrected, having put their necks on the line to live and rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So what does that say if this is the actual seventh Sabbath? Because if we go to Leviticus 23 again, and pay attention to what it's saying. It told us that it was the Feast of First Fruits that the sheaf of the wave offering happened. And the Feast of First Fruits is the 16th day of the third month. When we go to the Feast of Weeks, it told us that from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. If we take it from where it's said at the Feast of First Fruits with the sheaf of the wave offering, then that means the 16th day is the beginning of the weekly count, and the seventh Sabbath is the 26th, uh, 22nd day of the first month. You following? Let me prove to you the Sabbaths. Remember what we said. First of all, we proved it in Luke, right? In Luke 23, at the end of Luke 23, that it was the sacrifice, it was the 14th day Christ was crucified, and before he could be, uh, um, he had to be taken down because it was preparation day, because what? Sabbath drew nigh. That meant the 15th day was the Sabbath, right? So what does that mean? He was crucified, put in the grave, and before sunset he had to be in there, because why? The 15th day was the Sabbath. Leviticus tells us that the first day of unleavened bread begins on the 15th day, even though it's a Sabbath, and it runs for seven days, which means it ends on the 21st. That's not a Sabbath. The 22nd is the Sabbath. You see, it began on the 15th of Sabbath. It didn't begin on the morrow after the Sabbath. Unleavened bread began on the Sabbath. But on the 16th was when they came and waved the sheaf offering on the morrow after the Sabbath. It's Resurrection Day, the Feast of First Fruits. So it seems highly probable and much more likely that we're to count from the 16th day of the first month and not from the 23rd day of the first month. This is where it all began, even in the creation. So what does that mean? He's representing the, the first of the first fruits. So what would be the 16th day of the third month this time? So 16th of Taurus, who would these guys then represent? You got it. The first fruits workers. Those who will put their necks on the line for Christ for the churches of the Gentiles. 
It's the Smyrna group. It's those who will suffer with him, to be glorified with him, who will be co-heirs ruling and reigning with him. And when does he meet with them? On the eighth day. You see, I told you I was more likely looking at this to this. Now I believe in all of this that we're looking at this to this. This is still a last chance possibility, but we're looking from here to here, from the 28th of May to the 5th of June. If this is his birthday, brothers and sisters, we've been talking for over four years about his birth representing the beginning of his 40 days. Meaning the seventh to the eighth day came first. And it just so happens when you do that count, it's from in the beginning to the pre-trib escape of those going to the wedding to then what? His birth and the beginning of the 40 days for who? His remnant bride putting their necks on the line, suffering with him, co-heirs who will rule and reign with him. Brothers and sisters, this is it. I hope I was as clear as I could be. This is it. The count began in 1953. True Feast of Weeks, whether it's the 8th or whether it's the 15th. True Feast of Weeks of 1953 to 1954, completed year one. 1954 to 1955, completed year two. The only way to get this revelation is to understand when it began to be theirs from Leviticus 19 and know that it couldn't have started just because they came into the land because the Lord then told them they had to plant trees. And what else do we know? They also had to have a government. It doesn't mean they started right at that time. It means they needed those things in place. And the Lord God said, my time is Feast of Weeks. Feast of Weeks, year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seventy. The seventieth year started at the Feast of Weeks, 2022, and it ends at the Feast of Weeks. 2023. I don't I, I, I don't know how much more clear it could be. We have the sun, moon, and stars. We have the scriptures that reveal history. We have the coins from the Shroud of Turin. We have his pendant. We have his pendant that nobody else, no other ministry, nothing on. We have never, there is never been a revelation to the understanding of his pendant. We would have never gotten to it without the Holy Spirit confirmation of right on target. 70 begins 50. Feast of Weeks, 70 years Daniel, begins the destruction and removal of the Jews in Israel and the 14 years begin. The first seven they'll be removed from the land, and the following seven is theirs for trumpets. I don't know what to tell you. The only thing that could be off that we haven't simply understood is the 70th year count. Nobody has been able to show us how it could be 75, 76, 77. Oh, sure, some people might say, oh, this, the, the fifth year isn't really theirs, but no, that's not what it says. It says that the new year of trees in the fifth year, it was theirs to eat. It was theirs now. That was the beginning of 70. That was year one. It's unbelievable. Like, soak this in a little bit. Rewatch it. Pause it. 
we're about to be before the Lord God. Either sitting in the lowest room in the third heaven, or here, girded about, strengthened and prepared to serve the Lord, whom we will also come to stand before, and he will serve us a meal. Isn't that wild that John told me that? Next time we meet, let's eat. This is it, guys. This is it. And as one last reminder, please help us support the ministry over in Uganda. It is exploding. But because the funding's been a little bit slow, we appreciate those who have, but we haven't been able to get the materials needed. So he had to postpone one for this weekend and push it to the 27th, 28th, because there's 150 people. 150 more leaders and people coming to learn the revelation of the Lord and to prepare for the coming in. We need to be able to provide these for them, guys. So if you can, we have PayPal, we have GoFundMe, or you can get our mailing info and everything in the description box under the video as well. Brothers and sisters, this is awesome. This is awesome. We're right here today. We are what? Six Sabbaths. The seven Sabbaths left to go. I love you. God bless you. I pray this blesses you and strengthens you. And that you are able to see the truth from his birth to his death and resurrection to the creation to where we are now. Revealed and understood. It is in order. And so are the months. God bless you. Bye for now.